our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. It is an honor to host distinguished scientist Dr. Ravi Sardeshmukh, who joins us from Majundar Shaw Center of Translational Research. After having completed his PhD in biochemistry from Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad, Dr. Ravi went to Washington University Medical School for postdoctoral research. There, he also worked as a visiting scientist at the National Institute of Health USA. For more than two decades, he worked at CCMB. He held the position of director grade scientist while heading the proteomics lab at CCMB. Later, he joined the Institute of Bioinformatics as a distinguished scientist. Presently, he is associated with neuro-oncology research at Majumdar Shah Center of Translational Research. In India, he has been the flag bearer of proteomics research and education and has been the founder president of Proteomics Society India. He is also associated with some of the international research initiatives in proteomics, such as Membrane Proteomics Initiative by Asia Oceania Chapter of HUPO and the ongoing chromosome-centric human proteome project initiated by HUPO. His research interests span in the areas of protein and nucleic acid biochemistry, and his earlier work included RNA processing, mRNA stability, structure-function relationship of ribonucleases, and their regulation. With this, we would like to invite Dr. Sardeshmukh for his lecture. Let's share the slide now. Let's welcome Professor Ravi for his talk. Sir, you can share your screen and start with him. Can you see it? Hello? Yeah, not yet, sir. Now we can uh, see your presentation. Yes. Okay. Please uh, keep the slides on presentation mode. Thank you. Okay, is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay Srivastava, for uh, calling me on this uh, occasion and talking to all of you. Um, I also thank for the uh, introduction. I did not meet and interact uh, late uh, Professor uh, Rinti Banerjee, uh, but from this meeting organized in her memory, I can imagine the affection and uh, the respect she enjoyed from all her colleagues at IITB, uh, 
Uh, I would also like to say that the gesture the IITB colleagues have shown for her reflects the scientific, reflects that the scientific and professional relationships uh, go beyond and touch upon personal and emotional sentiments. So I highly appreciate the, yeah. okay. the, the IITB team for this initiative to remember a colleague so dear and near to them through such a uh, scientific uh, tribute. I join all of them uh, with this small talk dedicated uh, in her memory. So in my talk, I'm just going to uh, talk uh, a little bit uh, more, you know, sort of historically, uh, how uh, our work has grown into um, uh, into uh, studying the uh, uh, the brain tumor, namely glioblastoma. Uh, I think all of us know that last two decades there has been a paradigm shift in the way scientific research and particularly the clinical research is carried out. We moved from hypothesis-based discoveries and hypothesis-based uh, uh, research uh, uh, to unbiased approaches, uh, which are facilitated by the new technologies, which allow uh, new technologies like genomics, proteomics, and now metabolomics and other this thing, which allow uh, direct analysis of biological samples. It could be tissues or body fluids. So uh, omics approaches have really taken the main stage in clinical research and have helped in understanding several aspects of uh, the human disease. For example, we know that when it comes to disease, patient heterogeneity is one of the uh, challenging uh, problems. Uh, and omics profiles do help in stratifying patients, uh, whether it is for treatment response or risk for uh, a particular disease or uh, some variations in the disease. And, uh, this thing. Um, when it comes to disease like cancer, intratumoral heterogeneity is another big challenge that uh, the researchers face. And now omics has moved from, uh, you know, from the level um, uh, that was uh, where, where in the beginning tissues were being analyzed, but now one can do uh, even uh, analysis at the level of single cells. And that really uh, tells us how uh, molecular heterogeneity spreads within the tissue. Uh, recently, uh, there have been a lot of attempts and uh, successes in trying to connect molecular profiles with anatomic regions uh, or even physiological regions, which are reflected in histological and radiological images. And that is going to take, uh, take us to a stage where one can uh, really understand uh, disease, particularly case of cancer in three dimensions and this thing. So we have been uh, working in primary on primary brain tumors, namely gliomas and glioblastoma for several years. And uh, we use uh, multiomics, molecular profiles, ask a clinical question, select some of the differential molecules, uh, try to cross-check them, validate them against a particular clinical question that we see and make some kind of interpretations, both to understand the biology of the tumor, as well as uh, think if we can uh, develop some uh, applications for uh, this. Thing. And I've been doing, as it was told in the introduction right now, I've been carrying out and pursuing this effort 
through two centers, Institute of Bioinformatics, as well as Mazumdar Shaw Center in Bangalore. Institute of Bioinformatics, quite a few of them, a uh, few of you would know that it's a private, non, not for profit R&D organization. Now it is under Manipal University, uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Um, and it is engaged in research using uh, systems biology approaches, genomics, transcriptomics, um, proteomics, and metabolomics, as well as cell biology and bioinformatics approaches. There have been uh, some major contributions uh, from uh, international contributions from IOB, particularly to mention is uh, the uh, uh, is unraveling the human um, protein reference database as well as the draft map of human proteins uh, some a few years back. We have uh, PhD programs and uh, other training programs, and uh, that really helps us uh, to keep uh, moving with uh, young people, uh, uh, young people participating in our efforts. The other organization, uh, Mazumdar Shah Center for Translation Research, it's more focused on translation. So we do have some exploratory um, uh, 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 people, uh, I mean, uh, uh, sections uh, who, who are engaged in exploratory research, clinical research, but then our aim is to take this clinical research and the output for from the clinical research to uh, product development. And we have a product team which really helps us to identify uh, uh, things uh, from the research side and try to develop some assays and products and so on. So when uh, my focus has been more on uh, proteomics approaches, but you will see as we go down the presentation, you will also see that we do use uh, other omics, uh, um, omics uh, uh, platforms or data and these things. So when it comes to proteomics, we are just talking about uh, trying to understand in a disease context, context which protein is expressed where, whether it is uh, in both in the tissues and cells, uh, the temporal changes in protein expression, uh, its modulation under physiological condition, and do it in a quantitative, uh, uh, quantitative manner. So one of the major things that is uh, that we see in or and do in proteomics is uh, actually see whether the, uh, the the methods really allow to understand both the structural changes as and more of changes in the abundance of uh, uh, of uh, a particular protein or groups of protein under different uh, conditions and uh, that really helps us to uh, uh, to make some kind of interpretations. Uh, so uh, we use clinical tissues, we use body fluids like plasma, we use cell lines, and then uh, try to uh, study both total proteins from this uh, in tumors and compared to normals, membrane proteins, nuclear proteins, and all these things has helped us to generate some kind of data resource, which we can really exploit it for uh, developing some kind of molecular insights, as well as taking them to uh, clinical applications. As I said, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of specific clinical questions. Uh, as I told you that today, uh, omic space not only uh, it is proteomics in the omic space, but uh, things have grown. Uh, we already have been doing very deep transcriptome analysis. Uh, we have now, people are getting into studying metabolites uh, to a large extent. So it is genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And all that together really gives us uh, the, uh, the uh, some kind of integrated picture gives large data set, then 
we integrate with bioinformatics approaches and try to make uh, interpretations. So our approach has been that we use uh, <clears throat> omics data, which is generated in-house uh, with clinical samples. We also use public domain data because right now, now there is enormous amount of public domain data uh, in various areas that uh, we uh, we uh, uh, want to embark on. Uh, we also get into uh, wherever it is necessary, cell-based experiments, also apply uh, omics uh, uh, strategies here, or using either cell lines, standard cell lines, or even uh, developing tumor-derived cell lines, uh, try to also integrate uh, histological and radiological imaging uh, and all this done in uh, uh, in the context of a clinical question and as i said we try to see if we can develop uh, both uh, the scientific insights as well as uh, uh, applications so uh, in the process of doing that uh, we uh, go for trying to understand pathways and networks and uh, cancer biomarkers. Uh, uh, this, we try to see uh, which of the molecules have the potential to uh, uh, for secretion so that one can uh, make use of uh, uh, detecting them in the body fluids. So we look for known molecules, we look for novel molecules, we look for regulatory proteins, tumor-related cancer secretome match, plasma detectable uh, secretory protein. And we are also now, uh, uh, of late, we have been also looking for uh, novel uh, variants of proteins uh, in the form of novel peptides, which represents splice variants or mutations of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the molecules, so um, so all these things in a done in an integrated way. But I must tell you that when it comes to um, omics experimental data, uh, I think the uh, statistical probability that reflects in the omics data is a major uh, factor. So one has to uh, apply a lot of quality control. This thing statistical evaluation of the data quality uh, and then also technical validation before you really accept the results. So in my view, uh, when it goes to uh, uh, say, for example, expression studies in this thing. So we have on one side, as I said, that the experimental data, we uh, look for all the analytical rigor that is required. But that is not enough. So we thought that it is also important to see what is the functional relevance of that data uh, 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 that we have. And if we can connect uh, anything that we observe uh, in functional context to a particular condition, here the tumor condition, I think we believe that uh, uh, it adds a biological confidence uh, to the data sets. And therefore, we are trying to apply, and you will see that in the subsequent slides, that we are trying to apply these uh, principles in really uh, uh, sort of sieving out and sieving in of uh, the molecular information that we generate, which we can take it for clinical applications and product development. So uh, multi-omics integration is something which uh, people are now trying. We are also trying to see how the, and here we come to prote um, multiomics where, where we try to see how the proteome transcriptome and the microRNAs, which are regulatory factors uh, for the expression of these expression changes of this, how uh, they can be integrated. So, uh, instead of simply going by what we see 
uh, in, at the protein level or transcript level or microRNA level, we also uh, uh, look for generating uh, a longitudinal relationship, the regulatory cascade, and do that in the functional context in GBM. And this gives an enhanced value for the data. And it also tells us how a particular set of molecules are regulated in the uh, in the cell. So as I mentioned that we not just stop at one omics level, but we try to whatever data we uh, get, both public using public domain data as well as the in-house data, we try to develop these cascades um, of all these molecules. So uh, you can see here that the data sets will be related in horizontal direct, uh, dimension in uh, with respect to all the different various functions and in the longitudinal directions in the regulatory um, context. And this way you can generate what uh, we call as two-dimensional molecular map uh, for, uh, for the data size. So uh, how do we, uh, we have done, and I, I will not get into all the details, but for GBM integrating all the data, we applied it to all different cancer hallmarks as they are seen in, in GBM. And uh, we have a kind of snapshot of microRNAs and protein uh, transcripts and proteins, the target targets of uh, the microRNA, expression targets of microRNAs, uh, various microRNAs. And not only we have an integrated snapshot, but we have it for every process uh, that is uh, separately for every process which um, uh, which uh, uh, goes for uh, goes as the hallmarks of cancer. And just to give you a kind of summary, that if you simply take all these different hallmarks uh, from hundreds and perhaps even larger number of genes and um, uh, definitely, you know, thousands of genes and proteins and many hundreds of microRNAs, we come down to uh, this kind of numbers uh, of genes and microRNAs and the interactions, which we think are uh, kind of uh, very major interactions. And in fact, if we look for the hub genes and proteins and microRNAs, you can see that you can get some information about which are the high impact sets of uh, these molecules which are longitudinally related. So um, I will not go into the details of this particular slide, but it tells us, you know, what are the kinds of uh, uh, microRNAs and, uh, and uh, proteins and genes which are involved, which pathways are involved, which pathways are which cascades are involved in all different hallmarks, which cascades are involved in some hallmarks or a specific hallmark, and a lot of information that can be uh, got into this. Mm -hmm. I just want to give one example that this is uh, a kind of invasion related molecules and the network of microRNA and uh, target uh, transcript mRNA and protein cascades. Um, and uh, similarly, we have also developed a network for with all the DNA binding proteins, including a very specific transcription factor. We went a step be beyond and we integrated the, trans uh, the invasion and the transcription network. And you can see here that these two molecules, this is YBX1, which is a transcription factor, and there is another factor, Pura, particularly YBX1 which is regulated by all these different microRNAs, which are also you know, shown to be inversely expressed in GBM. But you can see here that these are the transcription factors which form a very central core for this entire network, which includes even invasion-related molecules. And that tells us, this, this is something which we published some years back. Uh, this, is, uh, this tells us that uh, YBX1 is, it plays uh, a very, very major role in invasion related process. And uh, we know that YBX1 
as transcriptal factor and as a molecule involved in many uh, processes in the uh, many cellular processes it is already uh, sort of uh, identified as a target in other thing but we can see now that it, uh, it can behave uh, or it, it can uh, it can uh, qualify as a very major target uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in gpa and uh, this is just to uh, describe different roles of ybx1 i don't have to spend time in going except to say that it has uh, multiple um, multiple roles and uh, roles in multiple processes. It's not only a transcription factor, but it also is a splicing factor. And recently we have done some analysis looking at the splicing uh, 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 role of YBXN. And uh, we have found, again, uh, I will not go into the micro details of this, but just to tell that YBX1 uh, controls the splicing of many other important regulatory genes in the uh, which are relevant to tumorigenesis and the splicing of those genes and we have some data to show that the genes have the uh, binding uh, domains uh, by bx1 the binding domains in this and so on and so forth and all these genes are also important uh, uh, for different hallmarks of uh, hallmarks of uh, cancer. So um, that is some one way uh, we get the integrated information. I just want to uh, move a little bit uh, differently and tell you about one of the molecules that we have been studied, a receptor molecule, which is a GPCR, adhesion GPCR. And uh, we have done some uh, cell base, uh, not, uh, not only we have analyzed this in in the tumor, but also we have done some cell-based studies. And just to keep things short, we want to, uh, I just want to say that uh, this particular receptor and its interactor, TG2, which is a, an ECM protein, also has roles in TG2 is transglutaminase. Uh, it, uh, not only it is an ECM protein, uh, working as a scaffold for ECM and cell, cell interaction, but it also has uh, intracellular roles and it's a multifunctional uh, protein. And the interaction of this protein we have studied using uh, GPR, GPCR's uh, 56 knockdown cells and doing multiomics data. And the summary observation is that uh, uh, GPCR, in fact, is. Um, express heterogeneously in the tumor. But important thing is that uh, its expression and the expression of TG2 are reciprocally related in all these different areas or um, areas of the tumor, uh, particularly in the hypoxic areas of the tumor. And uh, 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 the molecular data that we have generated using this cell line, it amounts to suggest not only just suggest but also gives a lot of support to say that this interaction is at the base of uh, 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 transition of uh, the proneural type of cells which are equivalent to epithelial uh, cells in the uh, in other solid tumors uh, uh, to mesenchymal type and you know that the mesenchymal type of cells are more migratory. They contribute to invasion, migration, and uh, spread of the tumor. So uh, this is a, a, a paper which is uh, recently in press in Frontier Cell Oncology. Uh, it should be out uh, sometime this week or uh, next week. So we want to uh, take all this molecular data uh, that um, uh, suggests us that its role in mesenchymal signatures and uh, uh, see whether this can be uh, taken to some uh, kind of application. Not only to find some target, but one of the things is that when uh, tumor after treatment, after surgery and uh, radiation and chemotherapy treatment, 
when the tumor recurs, it actually GBM recurs as mesenchymal type. So, uh, which is very aggressive, which is treatment resistant and things. So we thought that we can use these, uh, uh, these markers, particularly those candidates which are secretory thing and try to use them uh, as surveillance markers. And we are moving uh, in that, uh, that direction. So not only we can see upregulated protein, the secretory candidates, which can uh, be taken in the surveillance mode, but you can also take downregulated uh, proteins and sort of uh, translate them or use the surrogate, uh, so uh, uh, use the regulatory microRNAs, which would be upregulated as surrogate, and then also use them for uh, surveillance of. Uh, the uh, recurrence. Uh, so <clears throat> that is, you know, that is how we even the cell based experiments can lead to some kind of clinical application. I just want to spend a few, take, uh, um, uh, give you a few slides to tell you that we are looking for novel um, proteins and expressions in the tumor. And we have developed a pipeline doing using some deep proteomics and deep uh, RNA-seq uh, data for mm -hmm. this. And we all know that um, apart from the canonical or expression of canonical proteins and mRNA, there are also variants, variants which originate from alternative splicing, expression of um, intro or novel expressions uh, originating from expression of intronic regions, expressions from uh, untranslated regions, pseudogene expressions, frame shifts, and fusion genes, and things like that. And um, uh, we uh, we have developed. Only thing is, I think, Sanjeev, how much you can I have? Few minutes, or how is it? How am I doing? Hello. Okay. Uh, sir, you have five minutes now. Oh, oh, no problem. Okay, so. Uh, 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 just to make things simple and also uh, 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 quick, let me tell you that when it comes to protein expression, we are taking uh, protein expression, uh, so protein identifications. We are not stand in a standard way. We are identifying proteins in the form of triptych peptides, which match to theoretical triptych peptides of different proteins and the databases which are. Uh, but then how do you identify these novel peptides? And the for, for novel peptides, then what we do is that whatever data which is remaining, which does not map to the canonical peptides and canonical sequences, protein sequences, you can use that data to identify uh, novel peptides. And for that, we use, we take the transcriptome, translate it in silico in three frame or six frame, and uh, 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 further digest it with chips in again in silico, and you make a custom database of triptych peptide, which may include all those different uh, events that I talked about in the previous uh, slide, and then match this residual spectra to this kind of uh, theoretical spectral candidates and identify what uh, can be. Uh, defined as novel peptides. Then you map them to protein coding sequences. If it happens to be an, uh, a new exon or um, uh, different splice junction and things like that, or you can uh, even map them to novel non-coding sequences in the in the genome. And we have a, a large number of uh, uh, so there is a very uh, elaborate pipeline uh, uh, to to really uh, to uh, uh, get this capture this information. I will not go into that, but just to tell you that uh, this pipeline we uh, applied in the beginning to breast cancer, and the uh, paper is uh, 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 already in press for molecular in molecular cellular proteomics, and we identified. Uh, using the public domain data because we don't work on breast cancer, uh, novel peptide, a full landscape of novel peptides 
literally uh, uh, hundreds and close to thousand well-validated novel peptides, and uh, then we look for their significance, and we uh, we found from this six novel peptides whose high expression was found to be associated with poor survival of uh, one particular subtype of breast cancer. The point here to make is that you can really do these analysis and try to find out the clinical this thing. We are also, we have implemented that for GBM. We are further uh, improving that uh, pipeline to bring more and more confidence. But some of the initial results, again, we see that there are novel variants and novel peptides corresponding to important proteins like uh, NCAM, uh, this is a synaptic protein, FAF1, and HNRNPB2, which is involved in many, many uh, regulatory processes in events in this thing. And we will be studying the survival association, existence of these peptides in full length protein, the structural and functional consequences of uh, this protein. In a, uh, uh, in a present uh, 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 trend, it is moving. As I said, that we don't just stop at the molecular um, uh, molecular um, information, but we also try to relate now we are doing. We don't have any data right now, but we have ongoing effort where we are trying to relate molecular uh, data with imaging uh, signal, histological feature using computational approaches and, uh, and trying to see if uh, we can uh, get some useful information. I stop here by once again <clears throat> uh, thanking uh, Dr. Sanjeeva and his team, and uh, also remembering um, uh, the um, late uh, Professor Rinti, and, <clears throat> and thanking all my colleagues who contributed uh, in this effort. The GPCR work was, is done by Raksha mainly. Hari and Lavanya are involved in the proteogenomics and novel peptide thing. Divya is, uh, uh, is involved in 2D maps. And as also Manoj and uh, Savita, who are not with me now, but they really initiated the integration work in this. Then um, Komal Prasad, Shibu, and other clinicians are my uh, very supportive clinical colleagues. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I now request audience, if they have any question, they can ask now. Uh, sir, actually, I have just uh, a question for you. Uh, in your uh, uh, novel uh, peptides part, uh, yes. you showed some some peptides that uh, they have come novel in your research. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh, like you have done the transcriptomic analysis, and then you have used like <clears throat> created a customized database and used that database for the protein identification. Is it correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, so like, is there any other way uh, by which you have validated that, okay, these peptides are, you know, is there any way of validation of the data? Y yes, yes, there are various ways and it's very important uh, to show that these peptides that you are identifying, particularly those which are in the non-coding regions and uh, because you don't know whether they are real or some kind of false identification, there are multiple ways. Right you can do that. There are bioinformatics ways. Uh, one thing is we have applied some bioinformatic ways where we have used some of the validation tools uh, uh, that are available uh, to see. For example, one tool is uh, just to take these novel peptides, research them by shuffling sequences and this thing and see whether you can you can uh, so do it in a targeted way in silico, uh, shuffle the sequences and see whether the spectra really match uh, and pick up the same sequence or not. That is one uh, way of doing it. There are also some new validation tools 
based on AI and ML approaches, uh, where, uh, you know, based on large amount of uh, experimental spectra from synthetic peptides or other triptych peptides, um, one can make, given a sequence, one can, or the tool can predict, um, uh, uh, predict uh, uh, the spectra, and then you can see whether your spectra match uh, with those predicted spectra. Okay, that, that's one thing. The third thing is that you can make synthetic peptides uh, for these sequences and then generate targeted uh, uh, spectra for those synthetic peptides and then see how it is. But you cannot do that with uh, a large number of peptides, but uh, you know, for some selected peptides, uh, you, can, you can do that. So yes, what you say is right. Um, uh, it is, uh, say for example, we also, um, we have done some specific work with NCAM even earlier, and whatever in that case, uh, the exon that we identified or exonic new exo novel exonic peptides that we identified, we um, uh, actually look for whether it is present in the uh, protein that can be, or NCAM protein that can be captured from the gel and then see that that peptide is present in that particular uh, gel slice and this thing. So you can, so there are multiple ways, but as you said, Validation is extremely important, and that is how uh, the initial output, which gives us thousands, finally, you know, we come down to about 25 30 percent of those peptides as we keep applying the different uh, screens at different levels. So, there are multiple ways of doing it, and uh, finally, we have to see what is its biological significance. So the kind of survival analysis uh, I, uh, I mentioned that if the peptide sequence shows association with survival and not the parent sequence, that really indicates that there is some kind of biological implication of these peptides. So multiple ways, yes, that's right. Uh, and other question, uh, since you showed uh, the that you have worked on cell lines and the tumor tissues both, so, mm -hmm. like, do you think that the because the GBM is highly heterogeneous tumor, so mm -hmm. do you think working on a cell line? Because do you think that the cell lines actually mimic the heterogeneity of the actual tumor tissue? Of course, they're not. But like, how much we can rely on the cell lines? Yeah, so you are you are right. Tumor. Yeah, tumor derived cell lines. Um, um, it's a uh, now you know all the standard cell lines are. Uh, being replaced with tumor derived, but as you said, it is important. You can't just use any cell line. You have to characterize the cell line in detail with whatever markers, and you have to see whether, as I said, that heterogeneity. Then you can also see whether it's a it represents a mesenchymal cell type or it represents uh, other cell types that we see in the, this thing. So unless you characterize the cell line, uh, I think use of tumor derived cell lines is not uh, uh, will will have some challenges and you know may give wrong leads but uh, you have to so these are kind of uh, quality control measures that you applied in your experimentation and data analysis and interpretations yeah right sir so thank you so much for a talk it was very good experience yeah thank uh, you Okay, Ankit, uh, if you have any questions, you can Yes, sir. So thank you for your talk. So, sir, I had one question. It's like that in the trial, we have shown some integration of the different omics data at different levels. So, for mm -hmm. instance, this uh, transcriptomics data is this microarray data, then RNA seq data, then the proteomics data. So, all the data comes at different scales and requires different kind of analysis. So what are the strategies that we can integrate those data at the gene level or the pathway level or how does, um, what are the strategies that we can take to integrate these kinds of data? Uh, I don't know if I understood your question right. What you are saying is that how you can go to uh, applying this to pathways and uh, 
in other uh, interactions or processes or something is that what yeah at the means yeah means at the gene level or at the pathway level means can we correlate the data means or how can we correlate because that's what, scaling... that's what i'm saying i i did not yeah. go into those details but we have a lot of data with that uh, i mean a lot of uh, uh, observations with that as to which of the um, microRNA and target sets and cascades are uh, uh, they they go with uh, some of the processes what kind of molecular um, entities are there for example if you take map kinase uh, how many um, uh, how many processes map kinase is very important it is connected with all all hormones and it has regulation uh, regulatory i don't remember uh, the numbers exactly but uh, you have molecules which are relate a uh, sort of regulated by one particular microRNA or more than one particular microRNA, and that is something which meets the probability uh, criteria and this thing because they they are kind of they map to sequence criteria that is um, uh, sequence criteria as well as inverse expression they they pass through the prediction tools as targets uh, you can even see that they are inversely expressed in the in the tumor so there are many a uh, lot of this information i, th I think um, you know when we really come up uh, 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 we are writing the paper on that the first paper was published uh, about the uh, the basic concept uh, much earlier, but um, now we have this uh, elaborate analysis. And the quick answer to that is that all these cascades, you will not get everything, but those which map to the defined criteria for building the cascade, those can be aligned with different processes. And I don't know whether they can be aligned with different pathways because activity is another thing I have not done, but processes we have done it with different processes. In addition to that, you can even associate it with different anatomical features uh, that we see in the tumor. So we are uh, we have done some analysis for that also. So some of the histological features that can be connected with molecular data, uh, that also, you know, you can uh, you can map this. Uh, I don't know if I have answered your question completely, but uh, you know one can even discuss it uh, outside this presentation. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I have understood a little bit like it processes uh, different processes at this level. We can go, but if right, I will right. get back to you if I have any further sure, doubt. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Well. It was excellent uh, work. It looks like a lot of new progress being made, and we we'll look forward for more research publications from your group. So thank, thank you for accepting invitation thank. and uh, delivering this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev. So thank I've you. stopped sharing and. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have with us Dr. Nitin Zoshi, who joins us from Harvard University. Dr. Nitin Zoshi is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and an associate bioengineer in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Zoshi obtained his PhD degree in Biomedical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, 
under the mentorship of late Professor Rinti Banerjee. He did his postdoctoral fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital with Dr. Jeffrey Carr. Dr. Zoshi's research work has been published in top tier journals, including Nature Communication, Science Advances, Nano Today, Biomaterials, and Journal of Control Release, and has been highlighted by multiple media outlets and scientific journals around the world. He has received multiple awards for his work, including MIT's Technology Review Magazine India Award, Lockheed Martin Innovation Award, Boston Patent Law Association 2020 Invented Here Feature Honorary Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nitin Zoshi. Hi, uh, are you uh, Dr. Yes, sir. Yeah. over to you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Should I share my slides? Hi, Nitin. Oh. Welcome to the yes, conference. Hi, Professor Shivasta. How are you? Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me today. Let me share the slides quickly. Yeah, it's, it's sharing right now. I'll begin in a minute, sorry. That's okay, sir. Thank you. Does, so can you see can the slides? See okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. You you see the full mode presentation presentation mode, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Please continue. Just okay. Just give me one second. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, if anyone is from US, then good morning. Um, uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizing committee of TRIM 2022 for uh, giving me this great opportunity to speak today, um, especially because uh, Professor Banerjee uh, is very close to my heart and she has a very special place in my heart. She was a great mentor, educator, teacher, and uh, and most importantly, a great uh, guardian for me during my entire stay at IIT Bombay uh, when I was doing my master's and PhD work there. I believe she's uh, the one because of which I actually ventured into translational medicine research and um, and she sort of uh, also shaped my interest into academic research, I believe. Uh, today for this talk, I have decided to speak about some of the work that my group has been doing uh, in relation to our intra-articulate drug delivery for arthritis. And I decided to choose to speak about this work uh, because uh, this was also of huge interest to Professor Banerjee. Her lab used to work a lot in this area back in 2013 and before that when I was in my PhD there. So, um, so just to give you an idea of what we do. So my lab basically focuses on developing translatable drug delivery solutions for uh, addressing unmet needs across a wide range of diseases, including arthritis, cancer, asthma, respiratory infections, uh, transplantations, and also brain disorders. Um, we, uh, in the context of uh, arthritis, the motivation for our project or what we are trying to do stems from uh, the fact that over the past 20 years, there have been 
more than 3,000 reports that have been published uh, in PubMed related to intra-articular drug delivery in the context of arthritis, but the clinical translation uh, of these promising approaches has just shown very limited success. Uh, and to date, there has been only one uh, FDA-approved product in the market, which is basically just uh, a PLG, a microsphere formulation for uh, intra-articular delivery of a corticosteroid for inflammatory arthritis. So a few years ago, we decided to dig into the uh, the reason for this mismatch between uh, an enormous number of published reports in past 20 years on the preclinical models and limited clinical translation. And we were able to identify you know, multiple unmet needs that exist in the, uh, in, the, um, in the area of intra-articular drug delivery. And my lab has been trying to focus on two of these unmet needs over the past several years. Uh, this is the work that I also started during my postdoctoral period and then, and then continued uh, in my lab as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll deep dive into the two unmet needs as we advance the presentation, but just to give you a summary of the of these two unmet needs that we are trying to address. Uh, so the first one pertains to uh, pertains to the inability of uh, the previously developed approaches. Uh, to titrate drug release in the joints in response to variable disease activity, or as we call them, flares, which are more common in the case of inflammatory arthritis, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, we believe that it's important to have a system that can actually titrate the drug release uh, in response to these variable flares instead of just offering sustained uh, release over a, over a long period of time. The second uh, unmet need that we are trying to address is related to minimizing the impact of repeated mechanical loading of joints on the release kinetics of the drug, which is uh, most uh, which is more critical in the context of osteoarthritis and the delivery of disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs, as these drugs are intended for uh, uh, people with early disease when they are mobile and doing all kinds of strenuous activities, for example, running, playing sports, exercising, etc., and uh, the mechanical loading, uh, repeated mechanical loading in the joints because of these activities can have an impact on uh, the architecture of the drug delivery platform and also on the release kinetics of the drug, which can have detrimental impact on the release kinetics. So uh, moving forward, I'll try to show you how in, in our lab we have been trying to address these unmet needs by developing uh, simple and scalable approaches that can be translated uh, into clinics. So talking about the first admit need, uh, which is basically the, uh, the, 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 the inability of the previously developed approaches to titrate drug release to the variable disease activity, to address this, we have envision the development of a flare responsive intra-articular drug delivery platform. Now, to just give you a bit of background about inflammatory arthritis and variable disease activity in it. So people who have inflammatory arthritis, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, they don't have pain inflammation all the time. There are periods when they experience uh, lots of pain, lots of inflammation in the joints, and the disease activity is very high. But then there are also periods when the disease is dormant and these patients are completely fine. So we envision that an ideal drug delivery platform for such an application would be one that can titrate drug release in response to the disease activity instead of just do, just offering a sustained release over time because sustained release from these systems can result in um, sub-therapeutic or supra-therapeutic levels of the drug in the joint, especially when the, uh, in, in, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, high disease versus uh, torment disease. So uh, to do that, what we to develop such a system uh, which can respond to the inflammatory flares in the joint and can release the drug in response to that, we looked at the generally recognized as safe list of FDA, which consists of hundreds of molecules which are present in your food as flavoring agent, coloring agent, et cetera. We screened the entire grass list of FDA to identify amplifiers, that is molecules which have an hydrophobic and a hydrophilic part connected together by an enzyme cleavable bond, for example, an ester linkage. We were able to identify multiple molecules. Some of the examples include derivatives of vitamins, for example, scorbyl palmitate, derivatives of sugars, for example, sucrose palmitate, sucrose stearate, and other molecules like triglycerol monosterate. We did an extensive biocompatibility study to identify which molecules will have uh, maximum biocompatibility or least uh, inflammatory activity in the joints, and we were able to get this particular hit, uh, which is called triglycerol monosterate, uh, that we uh, found to have uh, a very good biocompatibility in the joints compared to the other molecules that we screened.
We then developed a process to self-assemble these molecules to form hydrogels, uh, which involves simple mixing of the molecule in solvents like DMSO water, followed by rapid heating and cooling cycle, which results in the micellization of these molecules. That is, these molecules sort of stack onto each other to form micelles that grow and elongate then to form these long fibrous structures that entangle together to form the bulk gel. And in this process, you can also add the drug, which can be non-covalently encapsulated within these fibrous networks. Now, the gel, unlike polymeric gel, has a butter-like consistency at room temperature, and you can inject these, uh, the system via any gauge needle into the joints. And once injected into the joint, uh, the gel sort of disassembles because of the cleavage of the ester linkage in the triglycerol monosterate molecule. And this disassembly then releases the drug. And what we have noticed, which I'll also show you later, is that you can titrate the release of the drug and the disassembly of the hydrogel uh, to the level of inflammatory enzymes or to the level of inflammation. So to test, so we over the past several years, we have been able to encapsulate a wide range of different types of drugs, including both hydrophobic and hydrophilic drugs into the system. Some of the other examples include antiretrovirals, antibiotics, and even some of the biologics, in, including proteins, antibodies, and nucleic acids. So to demonstrate that we uh, can release the uh, encapsulated drug from the system in a flare or in an inflammation responsive manner, we, this, we did the simple in vitro study where we took, uh, where we added synovial fluid from arthritic knee or healthy knee uh, from humans uh, into the release medium at different time points and observed the release kinetics of the drug. And as you can see here, when we added synovial fluid from the arthritic knee to the release medium, we were able to see an increase in the release on day 0, 7, and 21, but then the same release medium was spiked with um, the with the release uh, with the synovial fluid from healthy knee, we did not see uh, in, uh, any increase in the release. So this shows that the that the gels can respond to the inflammatory milieu and can release the ends uh, the encapsulated drug because of the inflammatory enzymes present uh, in in the synovial fluid. We then went ahead and. Uh, and demonstrated the flare responsive mechanism of the system in, uh, in, in animals. So in this particular study, we used uh, a, a, a KB Bion model of inflammatory arthritis. And the beauty of this model is that you can titrate the severity of the disease by just changing the volume of the serum that you are injecting um, uh, that you are injecting into uh, into the animals to induce arthritis. So we had three groups. The healthy group did not receive any serum, so no serum group. Uh, animals that were injected with 37.5 microliter serum to induce mild to moderate arthritis, and animals that were injected with 75 microliter serum to induce uh, severe arthritis. And then we tracked the, uh, also uh, right before we injected the serum to induce arthritis, we injected fluorescent dye-loaded gel into the right hind paw of the animals, and then we tracked the fluorescence intensity in the paw over a period of 14 days using in vivo imaging system. And as you can see, arthritic animals showed faster reduction in the fluorescence intensity uh, due to release of the encapsulated dye because of inflammation present in the paw. And interestingly, we also saw that the kinetics of decay of the fluorescence was basically faster in animals that have severe arthritis compared to animals that had moderate arthritis. So this happens because severe animals, severe arthritis animals have more expression of the enzymes in their paws, which results in more disassembly of uh, the gel and hence more release of the drug and hence a faster reduction of the fluorescence intensity compared to the moderate arthritis animals. So this study was basically a great proof of concept for us that gave us confidence uh, that this system can respond to the inflammatory, uh, different inflammatory conditions and uh, motivated us to continue uh, advancing this to determine therapeutic efficacy in the similar model, wherein we in injected the arthritis-inducing serum on day zero and two into the animals. And then right after that, we treated the animals with a single dose of either drug-loaded gel or blank gel or free drug. And then we measured the change in the right hind paw thickness in these animals over a period of 14 days. And as you can see in the right, um, uh, in the uh, in the in the bottom right corner, uh, uh, in the case of animals that were treated with drug loaded gel or TA gel, in this case, we did not see any inflammation for the period of 14 days. But uh, animals that were treated with free drug, we saw uh, similar inflammation as blank gel, which is expected as 
free drug uh, just leaves the joint within a day and does not uh, demonstrate any therapeutic efficacy. So this uh, overall, you know, we basically demonstrated that uh, this, this platform has potential to provide the optimal amount of a therapeutic at a time when it is needed, uh, thereby maximizing the therapeutic efficacy and prolonging the duration of the therapeutic benefit as well. Uh, we are, uh, so this platform was then licensed to a biotech company called Elevio Therapeutics in Boston, which was co-founded with Pure Tech Health uh, in Boston and aims to advance a number of different types of therapeutics based on this gel. And they are leveraging the inflammatory uh, inflammation responsive or flare responsive activity of this platform uh, to address unmet needs in areas like arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and interstitial cystitis that are accompanied with uh, periodic flares. So with this, I would like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the second unmet need wherein we are trying to minimize the impact of repeated mechanical loading on release kinetics of the drug, which can have implications towards more efficient delivery of disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs to prevent cartilage degeneration for osteoarthritis. Um, so just to, again, give you a background about the disease and how post-traumatic osteoarthritis manifests. So people who undergo severe knee injury, for example, football players in the field or uh, military personnel, uh, they can develop post-traumatic osteoarthritis over several years. So this knee injury predisposes the player to develop PTOA. You can stabilize the joint via surgery, but the inflammatory cascade that kicks in uh, you know, uh, results in joint degeneration over years. These people are completely healthy at the beginning. You know, they they can go back to the field and play sports. They can exercise. They can they can they can do all kinds of different strenuous activities. Um, so the current treatment strategy for these patients uh, is basically, uh, you know, just like uh, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, or intra-articular corticosteroid hyaluronate injections that can only relieve the sim symptoms. So none of these treatments essentially uh, stop disease progression and eventually knee replacement surgery is needed. Now, over past few decades, uh, there has been incredible progress in our understanding of the disease pathology or biology behind PTOA progression, which has resulted in a, a new class of molecules which or drugs which are called disease-modifying osteoarthritis drugs or D-modes in short. These are basically either small molecules or macromolecules that can either inhibit certain pathways uh, that are involved in disease progression or can upregulate certain mechanisms that can prevent the disease uh, progression. Uh, but the thing here is that these D-modes have shown great promise in preclinical models in uh, especially in mouse, rabbits, and rats, but the clinical translation has been very challenging, uh, which is because of the fact that oral and intravenous administration of these agents often result in low concentration in joints and high concentration in blood, and uh, that can also cause adverse off-target effects because they target certain pathways that are also uh, present in other tissues in the body. Intra-articular administration or local injection into the joints is ideal, but that suffers from short residence time due to rapid clearance of these molecules, which requires or necess uh, necessitates frequent injection that causes a risk of infection. Now, this has been very widely accepted in the community of our, you know, intra-articular drug delivery that increasing joint residence time of D-modes can improve therapeutic efficacy and enable clinical translation. And there has been a lot and lot, there has been a lot of efforts, you know, to develop, you know, platforms that can achieve this. But one thing that we noticed when we were initially thinking about this area is that since D-modes or these uh, disease-modifying drugs are intended for early disease, when patients are active and doing all kinds of strenuous activities, mechanical loading of the joint can impact the architecture of uh, or the morphology of the delivery platform and can also impact the drug release. Here in this example, we have uh, shown, you know, the sustained release kinetics of a D mode on the left on the left side uh, from a polymeric hydrogel, and as you can see, uh, you know, there's beautiful sustained release here. But when you when you uh, when you um, uh, when you subject this platform with, to mechanical loading uh, relevant to the human joints, you can see an increase in the release kinetics, which can uh, reduce the longevity of the system in the joint and also can impact therapeutic efficacy. But it was quite interesting and surprising that none of the previously reported intra-articular delivery platforms for delivery of disease-modifying drugs had considered the impact of mechanical loading on release kinetics. So this was the 
main and met need that we identified in this area. Then we thought of mechanically tough materials and we realized that they might not be an ideal approach to address this unmet need because certain tough materials, for example, polyether ketones, which are used in, um, uh, in uh, after knee replacement surgery, they exhibit, they undergo sustained wear and tear due, due to mechanical loading and uh, result in the generation of small particles or fragments uh, that can elicit an inflammatory response over time. Now, you can also have an approach where you can have tough, you know, uh, uh, poly uh, mechanically stable hydrogels, but they can, they require most of the time chemical cross-linking, which can have toxicity concerns because of certain types of cross-linkers that are used, and it can also complicate the scale-up and the manufacturing process. Soft materials are really ideal for these applications because they can also offer lubricating effects uh, in the joint, which has been previously shown to have a beneficial impact in terms of reducing the disease progression. But the issue with soft materials is that architecture gets damaged because of repeated mechanical loading, and that can impact the release kinetics, as I showed you before. So we, uh, we decided to leverage uh, the self-healing behavior, or what we call thixotropy, of low molecular weight uh, gelator-based hydrogel. So certain types of low molecular weight gelator based hydrogels have shown to exhibit you know dynamic self healing behavior that is under mechanical loading they transition to a viscous state and then uh, when you remove the mechanical loading they go back to the original gel form and we hypothesize that such a system might um, uh, such a system might uh, really uh, help with uh, reducing the impact of the repeated mechanical loading so here is the example here is just the hypothesis that i have demonstrated schematically. So if you inject this, such a system into the human joints and they're running, the system will transition to a viscous liquid. And when they, when the person goes back to the resting conditions, the system goes back to uh, being a gel. And this could, uh, and, and, and this gel form can have the similar release kinetics as, uh, you know, as demonstrated originally uh, in, in, uh, after the after removal of the mechanical loading. So to test our hypothesis, we basically mimicked uh, uh, human running onto a rotational rheometer where uh, we subjected the hydrogel loaded with a disease-modifying osteoarthritis drug, a cathapsin K inhibitor, L006235, to low strain and high strain conditions. So in the low strain, low frequency conditions that were applied for one minute, uh, we basically mimic the resting human joint. And then we applied high strain and high frequency conditions that have been previously reported to be uh, relevant to the running human joint. And these uh, were applied for either five or 10 or 15 minutes. And then the gel was brought back to the resting uh, hu uh, human joint conditions. And during this entire period of time, we measured uh, the storage and the loss modulus. As you can see on the bottom left uh, graph, uh, in the in the first uh, in the first minute when we had uh, when the gel was subjected to the low strain low frequency condition we observed higher storage modulus than loss modulus which uh, is expected as it's a gel and then uh, when we but uh, when we uh, applied high strain high frequency conditions we saw uh, increase in the uh, we saw a higher loss modulus compared to storage modulus which suggests that gel has now transitioned to a viscous liquid state but interestingly when we brought the gel back to uh, the the high the low strain low frequency condition we were able to fully recover the viscoelastic original viscoelastic properties of the gel and this happened irrespective of the time for which the high strain high frequency conditions were applied we we also took the gel out later and studied the release of the encapsulated drug, and we were able to see same release kinetics from gels that were subjected to mechanical loading uh, uh, as the gels that were not subjected to mechanical loading. So this was a great proof of concept that this thixotropic platform can actually uh, recover very quickly from the mechanical loading conditions relevant to running human joints without any impact on the release kinetics afterward, afterwards. We also looked at the drug loss during the mechanical loading, and we did not see any drug loss, which we attribute to the non-covalent interaction of this particular drug with the, with the, with the triglycerol monosterate molecule. So these uh, two molecules sort of interact in uh, via hydrophobic interaction, and we believe that during mechanical loading, when the gel is in a viscous state, uh, the hydrophobic interaction between the drug and the amplifier uh, help the drug to remain bound to the viscous state of the gel without any drug loss. Then we went ahead to demonstrate this in vivo in uh, in running mice. So in this case, we injected a fluorescent dye loaded hydrogel into the knee joint of mice. We had two groups. One group was made to run on a treadmill for at 400 meter for 30 minutes every day for five days a week. And the other group was not running. And then we looked at the fluorescence uh, of 
the gel in the knee joint over a period of 14 days. As you can see on the bottom left, um, we were able to see similar release, similar decay kinetics, uh, similar kinetics of decay of the fluorescent signal from both the groups, suggesting that the running induced mechanical loading in the mice joint did not impact the release kinetics of this particular uh, uh, dye. Then we injected a small volume, four microliter of the drug loaded hydrogel into the knee joint of animals. And in the control group, we just injected free drug. And these animals were also made to run on treadmill. And we wanted to see if we can, uh, if we can demonstrate sustained release of the drug in this uh, running condition. And uh, we quantified the amount of this particular drug via CMSMS at different time points. As you can see uh, on the bottom graph, uh, in the case of free uh, uh, drug injected animals, we did not detect any joint levels of the drug after day one, which is expected as the drug goes out from the joint very immediately and uh, and uh, and uh, resulting in uh, resulting in low levels after day one. Uh, in but on the other hand, in the case of animals that were injected with drug loaded gel, we were able to see sustained decay of the drug levels in the joint over a period of fourteen days, which uh, uh, which suggests sustained, which which basically um, proves sustained release of uh, the drug from this hydrogel under running condition. So having this exciting data and confirming that you know uh, that our gel is not impacted by the mechanical loading of the joint or can recover rapidly without any impact of the release kinetics, we then moved ahead to determine therapeutic efficacy in a clinically relevant murine model of knee injury that mimics how PTOA progresses in humans. So similar to uh, how humans experience, you know, severe knee injury while doing different activities, we induce knee injury in these mice by surgically destabilizing the medial meniscus, which predisposes these animals similar to how a knee injury predisposes humans to develop PTOA. To mimic, other, to mimic the strenuous activities that humans would do after they come back to the normal life, we, uh, may, uh, we made these animals run on treadmill uh, at 400 meters per uh, day, 30 minutes per every day, for five days per week, and this resulted in joint degeneration over several weeks, resulting in uh, PTOA. Now, to study the effect of our system uh, in preventing cartilage degeneration in this model, we did the DMM surgery on week zero. After three weeks, which was the healing time given to the animals to recover from surgery, we injected the first dose of either DMSO water, which is vehicle, free drug, blank gel, or drug-loaded gel, and then injected two more doses on, D on week five and week seven, and on week nine, we euthanized the animals and scored cartilage degeneration and also looked at micro CT images. Um, as you can see at the bottom graph, uh, we, uh, we got very high scores of cartilage degeneration in the DMSO water treatment group, which is basically which basically shows that there was severe cartilage degeneration. So the ORC scoring system, the way it works is zero indicates normal cartilage and six indicates maximum cartilage degeneration. Compared to this, when the animals were treated with the, with the drug loaded gel, we were able to see significant reduction in the cartilage degeneration score. Free drug, on the other hand, did not show any effect. We did see some effect, although not statistically significant in the in the case of animals that were treated with blank gel, and we attribute this to the lubricating effect of the gel, but we have to look into this further to really confirm that that, that is the mechanism. And here you can see um, the, the, you know, the representative histology images from the two different groups. As you can see, animals were treated with DMSO water, had fibrillation in the cartilage, also clefts forming. But in the case of drug-loaded uh, gel uh, uh, treatment groups, we were able to see smooth cartilage in most of the animals. We also observed greater than 40% reduction in the subchondral bone thickness compared to the DMSO water group in the case of uh, in the case of drug loaded gel uh, in the uh, drug loaded gel treatment animals. So all this data basically uh, shows that the non covalent encapsulation of disease modifying drugs in a thixotropic hydrogel can be a promising approach for reducing PTO progression uh, in the active joints, uh, which overall suggest the utility of this TG18 or triglycerol monosterate hydrogel platform to enable efficient uh, intra-articular delivery of DMO to prevent uh, the progression of osteoarthritis in active uh, patients who have early uh, disease. With this, I would like to thank my mentors, my um, um, and my students and my collaborators uh, who have really supported this work and all the funding organizations who have uh, funded uh, all this work. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I hope I didn't disappoint people by not talking proteomics in this session, uh, but I, I hope it's, it was uh, interesting and I'm, I'll be happy to take any questions.
Thank you, sir, uh, for such a nice talk. So I request from the audience to have any question. Sure. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I can. Hi. Nitin, this is Mukesh. Uh, uh, right now, oh. I'm working with Parveen at Instam. Hi, Mukesh. Hello. How are you? So, I, this is a very nice talk. Actually, I enjoyed a lot. Uh, so, this is similar kind of work. So, first question, I have a couple of questions. Like, first question, you use this TGMS based hydrogel for arthritis treatment, specifically for inflammatory arthritis treatment, right? So we use for both actually for osteoarthritis as well. TGMS base for uh, yeah. inflammatory arthritis. So yeah, uh, use, you know, yeah. uh, you generally inject the hydrogel in synovial uh, synovial fluid, right? Yeah. So it could it could uh, remain in the synovial fluid. It could be robust enough to stable for longer period of time. But still, people are struggling to deliver the drug. You know, one injection, intraarticular injection, can deliver the drug for a year. That would be more. Uh, beneficial for the patient because according to protocol we can't uh, do multiple injection within a year not more than two three injection right? right so what is the stability of this tgms hydrogel actually how long it could be stable okay whenever the uh, arthritis comes whenever the inflammation comes they can release the drug and again uh, once it is released and again flare ups down and uh, remain stable but how long it can remain stable like in the joint so yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, actually. So I I, uh, I agree that you know the I think the permissible limit you as you said is like two to three injections per year, and uh, and the in the in the very very beginning of my talk I think I mentioned about this FDA approved formulation which is based on PLG microspheres and I if I remember correctly that works for like you know three months per injection but still not good enough for our system because you know we are releasing the drug only when there's a flare we do expect the gel to la to to last longer, uh, you know, but the, the issue in the mouse models, Mukesh, is that, you know, we are limited by the tiny volume of the of the synovial cavity, right? So we have seen that, you know, the maximum we can go in the mouse model is, you know, eight microliter or, you know, that's the max we can do, but that's like the upper limit. So we have injected four microliter, which is very, very tiny volume in the in the mouse joint. And we have a, we have been able to see, you know, 14 to 28 days of stability of the of the gel uh, in the in the mouse joints at those volumes. Now, if you compare this to what is injected into the human, so in that is around, I think, if I'm not wrong, it's like around three mils or something like that. It can go definitely higher. So with the increased volume, you will also see longer residence time. But to really get a concrete idea of that, we I think we will have to do uh, you know like studies in sheep and goat models that really mimic the the human the human joint sizes so we are in process actually doing those studies so we don't know that we don't know for how long the gel will last in those bigger mm -hmm. joints uh, but that is something which we are interested to do right now is right right i think person or goat model they can give you more concrete exactly. uh, calculation so uh, actually one more question is that uh, okay i agree that uh, tgms is uh, generally recognized safe molecule a small molecule but still you are using dms so what is the concern uh, i think uh, dms still have some toxic effect or something like that no. right so DMSO is a very, uh, you know, no, is a very uh, normally used uh, solvent in bone and orthopedic applications, actually. Uh, and we have made sure that. Yeah, but limits... uh, I think uh, that is a percentage of DMSO, how much you are yes. using. Yes, correct. So we are we are using just 20 percent DMSO in our gel. So we, we are we are well below the limits that have been used previously for the for the orthopedic applications in the joints. So that is actually approved, uh, uh, I think. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, one more question, like uh, you also use similar kind of uh, hydrogel for osteoarthritis, right? So yeah, osteoarthritis is, is a pretty different from inflammatory arthritis. You might have injected in damaged part of our uh, cartilage, not in synovial joint. 
right? No, Am I so, right? yeah, no, so, no, no, no. So what we did in this study that we are doing right now is we just injected in the synovium cavity because I think the goal for us is actually to just do a sustained release. And we are hoping that the drug will, you know, like go to the chondrocytes and, you know, do its work, which we saw in our in vivo studies. But, you know, we have another system that we are, you know, sort of working on right now where we are aiming that, you know, the gel can actually, you know, like bind to the damaged part of the cartilage. So in this study that I showed, we inject in the synovium cavity and the aim is to just have sustained release in the synovial fluid and the drug can just enter the chondrocytes. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Actually, you know, Nitin, I was going through some papers. People are trying to develop some Absolutely. like uh, artificial cartilage kind of hydrogels, yes. polymers. Yeah. And all. So, yeah. so this thixotropic hydrogel, that is good idea, but... Uh, I think only TGMS can't make this kind of hydrogel. You might have used some polymer or uh, something blended, co, no, co no, assembled no, we, system. No, we have, yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things in case that we try to do in the lab is just to like keep the approach very simple and elegant, you know, at the same time. Uh, you know, if we try to, you know, do too many, you know, complicated things, that will, you know, that product will probably never see like the clinic, you know. So, uh, so and in this particular, and I, I completely agree that, you know, if there is a need, we have to, you know, definitely, in, you know, use, you know, polymeric materials and other kind of things there. But in this particular case, it was quite interesting that we have been just able to use TGMS without any polymeric material. But one thing I would like to clarify here, the goal of the hydrogel is not to regenerate, like the hydrogel is not acting as a scaffold or anything. It's just sitting there, uh, yeah, yeah, a, just to release hydrogen drug. Exactly, yeah. So we don't really need, you know, mimicking materials here. All we wanted to have is a system that can not, that can minimize the impact of the mechanical loading onto the drug release, which happens with the, in the case of polymeric hydrogels, actually. Some of the polymeric hydrogels, not all of them. Okay. Thank you so much, Nitin. Uh, uh, you, I wish Dave. you all the best. I think uh, Rinti, ma'am, uh, proud of you a lot. <laughs> Wherever she is, I I really wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank wonderful you so much, talk. Thank you. It was wonderful talking yeah. to you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I am happy to answer. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, that was okay, quite an uh, interesting uh, We'll move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Rachel. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, oh. We are delighted to have with us Professor Rachna, who joins us from JP Institute of Information Technology. Professor Rachna has completed her postgraduate studies in biotechnology from IIT Roorkee in 1998 and her doctoral studies from IIT Bombay in 2006. She is a professor at the Department of Biotechnology 
JP Institute of Information Technology since 2009. Before joining JIIT Noida, she was working at SPTM and MIMS University, Mumbai. She has been working to establish the mechanism of action of the herbal products in the field of diabetes, asthma, respiratory infections, skin cancer, neurological disorders, and COVID-19. Professor Rachna has been actively writing in scientific magazines such as CII, Ingredients of South Asia International, Farmbiz, Ingredients South Asia and Biospectrum. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Rachna. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Ekta, sir, for inviting me for this talk. And as I told in the afternoon that we are here together just because of uh, Professor Indy Banerjee. Um, uh, it's, it's unimaginable imaginable that what I'm feeling here, I'm right now sitting in uh, ma'am's cabin just near to her chair and uh, giving this talk. I, I just wish and, uh, that she would have been here and uh, looking at me and listening to me. So let me formally introduce myself. I am Professor Rachna. I'm um, working at the uh, Department of Biotechnology, JIIT, NOIDA. And uh, I, I completed my PhD uh, from IIT Bombay in 2006. Uh, I submitted in 2005 and got awarded in 2006. And um, I joined uh, MAM's lab. Uh, I finished my two and a half year in another lab and then joined MAM after two and a half year. And I could finish within this time period with MAM with good publication and patents. So today I'm going to speak about nanotherapeutics with natural products for human disease and health. That's what uh, I have learned from MAM. Uh, when I started my PhD, my work was on surfactant therapy for ARDS uh, in which we had used natural product that is eucalyptus oil. And that's how our journey started with MAM. So uh, currently my lab is working on respiratory disorders. I mean, uh, we're working with the nanotherapeutics uh, in the field of respiratory disorders like ARDS, asthma-like conditions, uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and skin cancer. And um, uh, why we have chosen this uh, like area, like medic why medicinal plant or natural product, because it is they are believed to be most of the time uh, very much safe and uh, economic. And they also have a multiple target approach. Uh, like it has been seen in Western world that the new molecules which are have been discovered so far, they have one molecule, one uh, target approach most of the time. And in case of uh, herbal product, because we have many ingredients, uh, naturally or we add them one by one to get multiple target uh, approached so that we can get a holistic approach to treat a particular disorder. And as I said, they are economic, easily affordable by everyone most of the time. And uh, a country like India also have uh, faith in traditional medicines and we are uh, choosing those uh, products from there and using them for ther novel, novel therapeutics. And why we are using novel therapeutics that we are discussing a little bit more. I'm sure that nobody needs this kind of basic thing, but for just for the completion of this presentation, I will be speaking a little bit more about the basic and then we'll come to the work which I have done here and then what I'm doing here in the JIT. Uh, so natural products generally are believed to be um, antioxidants and the whole theory starts from antioxidants, oxidant theory. Uh, any disease can be caused if the oxidant level goes high in our body. So if you see this complex diagram, if you see here that uh, we do have uh, nitrogen species generated in, our, in, in the cells, we have oxygen species generated in our cells, and these are actually required for normal functioning of uh, signaling mechanism going on in the cells. But obviously when they actually go up to the, a particular threshold value, then they becomes problematic for us. 
now to keep them on balance we do have certain enzymes molecules who keep them in on the particular level and uh, one of them is sod that is superoxide dismutase enzyme we have uh, then um, uh, ghs gsh we have yeah, gpx and catalase so these are some enzymes which actually keep their level down and that's how we are able to balance them and the disease may not occur but most of the time because of our lifestyle because of stress we take all these days uh, these go up and then they cause various diseases now what is the direct uh, there's no the excess direct impact uh, with the diseases actually there are two ways direct and indirect direct is that uh, these oxidative radicals will be increasing in the cells and they will cause oxidation of the lipid molecule dna molecule protein molecule enzymes and everything and that's how the cell will be hung so wherever this is increased level is happening those area will be hung so this is a direct impact like indirectly uh, if you, this level goes high then most of the time pro inflammatory and inflammatory uh, reaction starts and then it leads to several more other conditions complicated condition which actually leads to uh, the disease condition so if you see for over here this hydroxy radical is going high and then it is causing activation of nf kappa beta and then it is causing the um, expression of i late and dnf alpha addition molecules and many more so that's how directly indirectly oxidative stress is related to disease so generally what these medicinal plant do or any other antioxidant do they actually satisfy the unfair electron present okay wherever the oxidant uh, radicals have been induced so they they pair the electron and that's how the they are satisfy and then uh, the oxidative stress level goes down to so see and again in this diagram that how oxidative stress actually is causing inflammation and inflammation is causing oxidative stress ultimately if you go down in this picture you see that uh, all these processes very important processes of cell proliferation um, uh, how should i have to do this so cell proliferation cell death cell survival cell invasion and eugenesis cell growth all these very much essential processes get induced or regulated or get affected because of uh, the oxidative stress and the inflammatory conditions So you can see in this particular picture that uh, free oxidative, oxidative stress radicals they can cause disease in any any organ system or tissue system heart skin kidney joint lung brain immune system blood vessel multi organ and eyes and everything else so that's how it is so important to keep the oxidative stress down uh, and I, I think in this lifestyle that we are living in we we have been taking certain things very much knowingly like we are taking chawan prash we are taking green tea. We are taking aloe vera juice. We are having amla juice. All these th these things have we have now introducing in our diet. But naturally, traditionally, if you see, they have been included. They had been included in our diet, at least in Indian diet or Chinese diet. It has they have been included like a normal diet. Every day we we add we eat a lot of uh, like spices in our food, and we also have lots of fruits in our diet. Uh, we have salads in our diet. So this is like normal routine we used to have. But we have now replaced them with the cooked food, and then. Uh, with the processed food, and that's how uh, now it is causing more and more trouble. But now people are getting aware, and they are including those antioxidants in their diet. So having this uh, background, I can now move ahead. So what all natural phytochemicals we get from this salad or aloe vera or amla or whatever species uh, spices we are having are in the like form of tannins, lignans, flavonoids, terpenoids, carotenoids, and many more. and what from where we get it from as i said fruit vegetable leaves roots and etc and we have been having herbal extract in the ayurveda we used to take uh, quathas and teas and we also have pills syrup aswas ablehe like chavan prash so from all these are the sources we have from where we are getting this kind of antioxidants now not only um, you are talking about goody goody things about the natural products but there are certain uh, limitations with the natural products and that's have been addressed by uh, this lab and uh, many more labs in the world uh, that um, uh, generally the western world don't accept them as they are multi uh, molecules and uh, they are kind of crude in nature they mostly have small shelf life and bioavailability and uh, that's how we need something novel to be discovered and uh, people are using the technology to uh, convert them in such a way that they can be further uh, can further be utilized in a better way like they will be stable they will be having less biodegradability they can be having tish good tissue distribution and they can be sustained sustainably delivering the the molecules at the site of action and they can also have the pharma enhanced pharmacological activity you must have seen that when we take ayurvedic drugs powder and everything quatha and all we we are like hesitant to take them because they are generally large in amount 
and uh, you have to take it many times and then you cannot prepare and keep it for a longer time period so there are certain issues which we are like, to which we are we are and hesitant to take them so we have to uh, bring them to that level that they are patient compliant and we can take them as uh, like faithfully as we, we can take we are taking allopathic medicine like you have kept the medicine in the in some wrapper you open it up and take it and take, take it like a pill so you did get satisfied okay fine i took i took my medicine but here right now there are problems that we are hesitant to take such a large amount in like various time in the day so we have to bring that this to this level so here in this slide we have many herbs which are mostly used for respiratory disorders and i think most of you must be aware of most of these names like we have osimum that is tulsi we have eucalyptus uh, and the graph is very much right now in, in news Anographis and Tinospora, that is Giloe, Picturiza, that is Kutki, and we have this Glyza uh, uh, Gabra, that is uh, Mileti. Mileti is very, many, very much known for COVID also. Uh, people have researched a lot on, on uh, Mileti these days for COVID and many more. So these are the herbs which are mostly explored, and even most of them are, I also have explored in my lab. Why uh, these days there's increase in respiratory diseases and uh, people living in Delhi and CR or in Mumbai know is the best that how much level of pollution has gone up uh, in the cities because of the large population traffic and everything and we also are living very much unhealthy lifestyle and then there are evolution of stronger pathogen like SARS-CoV we are recently uh, facing right so um, even if we don't consider lung disease as such per se for uh, uh, for treating them, we can also address them as a site of delivery for many other diseases also. Everybody is aware of that. They have very much good large surface area. They ha it has the message of vascularization. It has very good considerable permeation and they actually pass hepatic uh, first pass metabolism as well. So whether we are uh, treating the lung disorder or we are targeting some other site, lungs uh, can be the site of uh, delivering the drug. But the problem here is that uh, the alveoli are very, very small and hard to reach. So we have to uh, formulate such a formulation which is very small in size and it can reach to the site of action so that it can be absorbed by the blood vessels and can reach the site of action, whether it is lungs themselves or it is somewhere else, it has to reach. So that's how the lungs are being targeted for themselves and for other diseases as well. OK, so we have to have desired size range, durability of nanoparticles against shear forces, deposition of particles should be there inside the alveoli, and there are chances of microcellular clearance as well, so we have to take care of that also. Uh, there are problems with the, that they get adhered to the mucus gel sometimes and then there are chances that alveolar macrophages will take them up and remove them from the system and even the uh, epithelial cells may internalize them. So what we have to do is we have to overcome all these challenges when we are deriving the uh, nano formulation for, to be delivered to the lungs. So the particle size generally is considered to be uh, less than 5 nanometer which is very hard to achieve. And um, we have to consider which we, in this range so that the phagocytes will not clear them up. And uh, there are chances if it is more than 50 micrometer, uh, micro, micrometer, then they will be cleared up. And there are many more problems. So there are certain problems which can be which can be addressed by doing some kind of modification on the surface and everything. But the first thing is to get the a particular optimal size range for this delivery. If we talk about the nano formulation for lungs, they are uh, of this type liposome, polymeric nanoparticles, solid lipid nanoparticles, nanosphere, nanocapsule, and nano emulsions. And then there are many more uh, which uh, I have not, not mentioned over here. So, just giving a, a generalized picture for these formulations solid lipid nanoparticles, liposome, polymeric nanoparticles, polymeric micelles, nanosphere, nanocapsule, and then we have uh, nano emulsions, which could be of two types oil in water and water in oil. Oil emissions. So, how uh, the things work in case of ARDS, that is adult respiratory distress syndrome, which was my PhD work. So, here in this case, two alveoli have been shown. Okay, one is small, one is big, and it's been uh, seen that uh, the physics says that if you have a smaller alveoli, it will collapse down to the bigger one. So, in case of ARDS, when the people are uh, the lungs affected inside the alveoli is inhibited. Uh, there are certain alveoli which are not able to expand themselves and they ultimately uh, they get collapsed into the larger alveoli and it keeps on happening and ultimately the entire system respiratory system fa can failure take place that the person is not able to breathe 
so that's how the physics work in the lungs and we have to take care that we have to supplement the surfactant by artificially from outside if the this kind of situation arises and this situation may arise due to many many uh, in many many conditions so first of all let's see how the surfactant works so this is our alveoli and here we have the type 2 um, pneumocytes which actually secrete the surfactant now what surfactant actually is it is a mixture of certain surfactant specific proteins and it has a lot of number of uh, phospholipids, cholesterol, and other lipids. Now, the molecule layer you see inside this alveoli, this is DPPC molecule, diphosphatidylcholine molecule, which, which is very, which makes a very hard layer inside uh, the alveoli. And if you go down, uh, I mean, uh, squeezing down in from this size of alveoli, they will not allow it to happen. These molecules will be straight, uh, standing straight, and they will not allow the, the alveoli to collapse. So that's how when we inhale again, we have that particular space that we can inhale again and we can expand the alveoli again. So when these molecules get disrupted by whatever reason, then it is hard to breathe and the person may collapse. Like in case of COVID also, that's the main reason that the people collapse because of the respiratory failure. So this condition of ARDS can arise in many conditions, whether it is a burn, burning condition, a person get shot dead, shot uh, by someone, or it is uh, being drawn inside the river, or it is uh, some uh, traumatic injury, or it may be tuberculosis, it may be COPD, it may be uh, any, many other conditions are there which can lead to the condition of ARDS. So uh, we have to see that we have to have that kind of surfactant available which can cope up or uh, with all these kind of conditions whatever is the reason for surfactant inhibitors. Physically active inhibitors, we have chemically active inhibitors which may be present inside the alveoli, uh, reducing down the number and the, the nature of uh, the surfactant. That's how uh, the surfactant is inhibited and the person is not able to breathe and ultimately because of multi-organ failure, the person would die. So we have uh, the drug molecule can be given in such a way and then we can have either mycel or liposomal form which we have worked upon to be delivered to the lungs. So let's see what this work was. So this work was basically of a traumatic injury. So when the person is uh, somehow uh, traumatized, I mean uh, the physical tra traumatic condition is there, the lungs have been uh, inhibited by blood uh, perfusion or maybe because of lung failure or maybe because of the, some other uh, organ failure so lungs have been uh, have been filled up with lung, uh, blood either or its derivative like plasma or serum or blood itself or maybe a component of that so it's been seen in the lab uh, using language graduate trough that uh, when you run this uh, instrument the surface tension start from around 70 and it goes down and it should reach near zero if it is a normal condition, that is the blue uh, curve you see here, that is the normal control condition where you have DPPC molecule going, going from 70 uh, 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 surface tension to the zero one. This is a normal condition. But when you have the blood component inside the alveoli, the surface tension may go high up to, you can see here, the seven. Uh, okay. So uh, as we can see, we have reduced down, reduced down this seven to zero again by having surfactant inside the alveoli. Now here uh, in the lab, in my PhD work, uh, we have used eucalyptus oil in different ratios and it's been found that when you have DPPC in combination with the uh, eucalyptus oil, the surfactant, the surface tension level goes down to even like near zero, even better than DPPC. So that's how we could develop the formulation, the laboratory for the treatment of ARDS where we even could file two patents for NRDS and ARDS both and both were then granted later on. Okay, so this is uh, the best uh, inhibitor we found in the lab, that is mem RBC membrane. The RBC membrane is interacting with the DPPC, you get uh, the surface tension as around 9 or 8. And then when you add, you have EO, eucalyptus oil in the formulation, then you, in the even in the presence of uh, membrane, you can reach surface tension as 0. Now, after having this parameter established, then we went for the development of formulation. So, so this is the cryo TM micrograph where Professor Velare helped me a lot to get these pictures because we used to sit for six and seven hours uh, closing our eyes in the lab to have these pictures of cryo TM because we have to watch these micro, uh, liposome in a very much low intensity of uh, the TEM. So there uh, sir came and then helped us out how to figure out what liposome, how it looks like and all. Uh, these are the DPPC li uh, liposome as you can see here and this is uh, the grid uh, corner and again we have here the liposome scene in this picture. 
there uh, we are showing dpc liposome along with the albumin albumin is also one of the inhibitor which has been found and uh, quoted many times in the literature inhibiting the lungs lungs effector and you can see very interesting phenomena happening that uh, the liposome is engulfing liposome so that's how we could observe under the microscope in the presence of albumin now this is with the in the presence of serum if you can see the number of liposome have gone down and there are very few number of liposome was seen uh, under uh, microscope so there is a description given on these liposome i'm not going into detail of that otherwise it will be going too long for the presentation later on uh, dppas uh, eucalyptus oil were mixed up uh, in a particular ratio in a particular form liposome were prepared and then then they were uh, even um, uh make the uh, very very uh, low in size so you can see this is dppc liposome and this is uh, along with the eu so this was the formulation we developed on which we got we could get the uh, patent uh, for the the two diseases so um this was a done a work was done by me ma'am along with the uh, professor bellare and now i will be talking little bit about the work has been done in my lab uh, with my phd student who is uh, dr manisha singh right now so this was this work was on ginkgo biloba which is a chinese herb uh, and this work was uh, to be applied apply on international application for alzheimer disease so here we develop nano emulsion formulation having uh, the standard ex extract of ginkgo biloba which is called as egb761 having isopropyl and uh, ipm280 and ethanol in the formulation as excipient so if you talk about uh, ginkgo biloba it's also called as living uh, fossil so these senescent leaf actually are the best one to extract make the extract these are the one who actually have the active phytoconstituents uh, to treat the enzyme disease and it is a very well known herb in china to treat enzyme disease now as i was telling you that we have to bring down this to that level that they work efficiently having good self help life and having good bioavailability so that people can trust it and uh, it will be having more efficacy also So this is uh, your in vivo biloba, and this is the senescent leaf where where the extract must have been prepared. We bought the extract from the market, standardized one, and then we mixed uh, uh, the excipient as IPM, twin AT, and ethanol, and the extract was mixed up uh, with this uh, excipient, and then we prepared the micro emulsions. And this is those combination which we have finalized to work upon further. Okay, where we have IPM, twin AT, ethanol in a particular ratio, and we have chosen certain um um uh, set from here so we have to use an ite for example here to go further for further analysis and for the characterization this is pseudotory di diagram which tells us whether um, water into oil or oil into water emulsion has been formed or not formed so this is a particular titration method of uh, software which has been used over here and uh, this particular figure she says uh, the the left one the leftmost one that this is the one which is making your oil into water emulsion which can be further utilized and further characterized to be taken further we went for then thermodynamic stability test whether the emulsion which has been formed is stable or not for heat for cooling for centrifugation for freeze and thaw cycles for dispersibility so on all these ground a particular formulation actually came out to be the best which we have taken further for further testing in vitro and in vivo okay so here we have uh, a1 a2 and a3 which were accepted and from here then further a1 was accepted we went for particle size analysis zeta potential analysis tm analysis ftir analysis for further characterization we also went for logical studies and antioxidant activity as i was explaining about the antioxidant activity which is very important to consider then it was found that uh, ita one was the best to be chosen which was having little higher particle size which is 1 to 59 a nanometer having minus 9 zeta um, potential this was taken further so this shows uh, the particle size and the zeta potential this is a prior, this is a t normal tm showing the micro emulsion droplets having the extract inside you can see these black particles uh, uh, these black particles of extract seen inside the micro emulsion this is zeta potential showing the zeta potential and then later on even the in vivo studies were done on mice where uh, the azimus was uh, induced in the mice first of all uh, then after that uh, they were giving certain tests like morris wasser mains test where we have a platform under the water where the mice will learn a particular pathway but if the uh, azimus is created induced then the mice will forget the path then you give this um, 
formulation intranasally this mice after a certain period of time again it regains its memory and it is able to uh, then um, find the ways out so this is uh, morris water maze test and uh, this is the bar diagram showing the same that how uh, scopolamine which is the drug which induces the alzheimer and here we have uh, uh, the alzheimer induced mice having the orally given uh, formulation and this is intranasally given formulation this is control so if you can, can, comp uh, can compare the control with the the formulation they comes almost alike and there was a significance also seen uh, that it was found to be normal then we also have gone for a wild maze test where again the mice will learn to get food from a particular path where if you give induce the alzheimer it will forget the path and then you give the medicine uh, internasally then it, it again we can recall uh, and learn how to get the food from a particular path so that's how we were doing the in vivo work the behavioral study first of all and then we also went for histological studies where we were studying the level of antioxidant catalase uh, even the acetyl cholinesterase activity a lipid peroxidation sod activity even expression of beta amyloid in the brain which is the main feature of alzheimer disease and also uh, in immunohistochemical studies in the hippocampal region hippocampal region of the brain this is how uh, the sample were prepared uh, it was showing the induction of first of all the alzheimers then the dissection of the mice taking out the brain from there and doing the all the assays after that catalase assay all those assay which i have mentioned uh, from the brain tissue and then um, uh, i'm going little fast because uh, it will be then again very very long to be describe everything so here i can sh uh, show you the expression of beta amyloid in the brain the cortical region so as you can see here that the level of uh, beta amyloid is very very high here and then uh, when you give the formulation it, it actually come down to very very low so that's how uh, it's been shown that how it can reduce down the beta amyloid uh, level in the mice brain similarly when we had the uh, histochemical staining okay so here uh, the lesion which was induced by the scopolamine which actually induces the alzheimer disease if you give the formulation this lesion has been now decreased down in this slides okay. so this is a two comparable thing this is the control and this is the uh, induced one and this is the formulation when the formulation is given the lesion is being increased this red region which is shown here is being reduced in uh, amount and size in this particular region uh, this is another work uh, just this is this is one slide that we are working with catechin hydrate uh, hydrogen crystal also nanoparticle also and right now uh, skin gels for skin cancer are in progress and nano emulsion for sars like condition are also in progress in my lab so there are some references over here so with this uh, i would like to show my team over there so this is sujata mamta dr manisha singh uh, and then uh, these are the currently uh, current phd student uh, dipanshi on the top and mansi uh, down and these two are working this is working she is working on skin cancer and she is working with the respiratory sars condition to develop uh, nano emulsions this uh, opportunity i will be happy to answer any question thank you rachna for a wonderful talk so uh, now i would request uh, participants if they have any question they can ask uh, dr rachna i have few questions like yeah. i don't have a background in the drug delivery but if you can like give me an idea uh, so you said there are various of uh, plant extracts you showed in your presentation so generally uh, when we talk, when we work on a small molecule we go with the drug ligand kind of a, like protein ligand kind of a study to check first whether they are interacting or not so here when you have a uh, like series of plant extract how do you know that okay this is extract this plant extract will work on this kind of disease so like how do you know if you talking about the kind of extract and the disease then yeah. there are a lot of literature available Okay. we are working with those kind of herbs which are already proven to be working in this condition what they trying to do is they trying to improve on that like we trying to improve their stability their bioavailability uh, their efficacy the shelf life so they are as i said kingo biloba is very well very well known for treating alzheimer disease but then the, when the patient takes it it is a huge amount of extract or quath or powder you have to take many times in a day and then it may not work it may work but we have to make sure that it reaches to the site of the action and works efficaciously efficaciously so that's how uh, right now what we are working on is mostly those herbs which are known 
to treat a particular disease or similar kind of a situation. So we try to first of all take them out and we prove in the lab that yes, it is in the same direction. What is known for the literature, we are getting similar results in the lab. And then we try to see what kind of formulation we can develop so that we can get that particular aim achieved that we have to reach the site of action with, the, with those properties. And once you're done with the modifying the condition uh, at which the efficacy is like the efficacy is what that you require to, uh, to treat the disease, right? So how do you know that, OK, this small molecule is uh, this uh, plant extract is working? So for example, in the drug, we perform normal cell viability assays. Yeah. So what are the assays that you usually perform with these uh, plant extracts to check the efficacy of these strands? So these just depend upon the disease, actually. Okay. So as, I, as you see in case of uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, we did assays like beta amyloid expression. We went for s type polymer strays enzyme expression. So these are then disease specific. See, one common thing is that you go for antioxidant assay, you go for anti-inflammatory assays, which is I've shown you that's common for almost all the diseases. Right. A person like who's doing MTech or MSc or a BTech project, they, they could reach up to antioxidant level maybe. But for somebody is going for PhD, then that person has to then go more specifically for a specific kind of assays, which will actually indicate the ATS. This is going to work. This is working. Thank you, Dr. Rachna, uh, for your talk. We can move uh, to the next session. We have. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. No, you can ask the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have just one question, ma'am. Okay. Uh, is this the gold standard? Uh, suppose you have given. Suppose you have induced uh, Alzheimer in mice. Mm -hmm. Is it confirmed that? Is there any other study to check whether Alzheimer has been uh, completely duplicated on the mice or not? So again, there are certain parameters which are like fixed or uh, reported and published. Again, I'm repeating this once again that for Alzheimer, beta amyloid expression is the key. That if it is even expressed in the brain, you can if you compare this with the control of normal mice and uh, Alzheimer induced mice, you have to compare whether beta amyloid has been expressed more in the induced one or not. And as I said, SSI for stress activity. So these are some key. Uh, essays you have to perform which, which are disease specific so that you have to compare with the control so control will say less and then your disease condition will say more so if it has been induced means those are expressed more okay. and then you have to again give the medicine and see whether it is coming down to the normal or not oh. so that's how we compare the normal and the disease one and the treated one these three things Thank you, Dr. Rachna. We can move on to our next session. Okay. Thank you. I will come back to that. With the whole side of it. So, hello everyone. So, so moving on to our next session. So we have uh, Professor uh, Dr. Amit Dutt, but uh, he is he will be a little late in joining. So we will be having one TED talk uh, from Professor Rinti Energy. So let us uh, look at the till he joins. Yeah, Ankit, but he is joining shortly, so you can play this thing. But you know, yeah, Dr. Amit is yeah, joining. okay. Okay, once he joins, we will uh, connect it in that we can share it. Good idea. After that, Norman Bushnell has said that everybody believes in innovation, but they do so till they actually see it. After that, they say, oh no, that'll never work. It's too difficult. And that, in a sense, 
is the difficulty that scientists and innovators always face in some form or the other. I'm here today to share with you my journey of innovation in the broad realm of healthcare. But before I begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Imagine a map of the world. You would imagine something like this because we're all used to having a map based on geographic or political boundaries. But if you were to look at the world in terms of other parameters, let's say health-based parameters, would it look the same? Let's have a look. This is the map which does not depict the political boundaries, but it depicts early neonatal mortality. What do we mean by this? It means what is the risk of a baby who is born of dying within the first week of birth, per thousand live births. And as this image shows you, there's a gross difference across various countries. And you see that developing countries, India as well as Africa, have a remarkable increase in this rate and hence are shown bigger on this depictive map. Again, when we look at neonatal mortality, which means over a 28 day period, once again, a similar trend is seen. The rates can change from 0.9 per 1,000 live births in Japan to 25.4 in India, and can go as high as 42, 45 in some of the countries in Africa. This seems like a gross, unfair situation. Why should a baby die just because where it is born and because it does not have access? to the correct amount of healthcare facilities. And this picture remains the same, even when we look at other parameters. This one, under five child mortality. And once again, you see the same grim picture, the developing world having much higher rates of the under five mortality. Now, the question is, is this meant to happen? We must do something to make healthcare technologies, services, much more acceptable and affordable to all, regardless of where they are. And here we see that even in maternal mortality, a similar picture emerges. And so this is the problem that we're trying to address. How can we have more equitable distribution of healthcare technologies and develop technologies which can be made accessible and affordable to all? And this kind of discrepancy is not only across countries, but within a country, there is a rural urban divide, right? In rural areas, in remote areas, it's much more difficult for the same individual to get access to the facilities. A simple thing like giving birth to a baby can then become so dangerous. So let's look at these infographics, which show you that it's 50 times more likely that there's going to be an under five mortality in the sub-Saharan African countries, as opposed to those countries which fare the best in this parameter. Similar picture is in maternal mortality. 99% of the deaths are in the developing countries. This brings us to the need of an accessible, affordable, and available healthcare system, which has technologies, development, deployment, as well as delivery, and yet of the highest quality. We we'll believe that science and innovation can play a role to bridge this gap. And most of my work over the last few years has been in the development of innovations to make a difference to healthcare, such that they can be more affordable, more accessible, and to the reach of the remotest areas and the poorest of the poor. Now, before I tell you about the actual innovation, I'd like to tell you how my journey began. Well, initially, I was a medical doctor and I was practicing in a rural area in Maharashtra. And one of the things I noticed was there were a lot of these tiny babies which were born before term. And unfortunately, in that rural area, the infrastructure that was available was not enough for us to be able to save their lives. Also, when we tried to transport them to referral centers, sometimes we couldn't get them there quickly. 
it seemed like such an unfortunate situation. It kept snowing in my mind, can we do more? We must help these tiny babies. And that's when I explored a little more. And this is what I found. Prematurity is actually a global health problem. Not only that, India has the dubious distinction of having the highest number of preterm babies per year across the world. We have more than 35 lakh preterm babies. And now this compounded with the fact that if the baby is born in a rural area, most likely it's a home birth, as well as they do not have access to intensive care facilities. So can we do something to uh, Hello all, so this wonderful TED talk of Rintimam is available in YouTube, so you all can go and search it. So now we have to move on with the session. So Dr. Amitath has joined with us. So we will be just introducing him and then he can start his talk. It's an absolute pleasure to have with us Dr. Amit Dutt, who joins us from Actrek Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. Dr. Amit Dutt is the principal investigator of Advanced Center for Treatment Research and Education in Cancer, Actrek Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. He has received his first doctoral degree from ICGEB New Delhi and later on received another PhD from Institute of Life Science, University of Zurich. Later, he completed his postdoctoral study at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT and Dana Farber Cancer Institute, Boston. He is a recipient of the Shanti Swarup Bhattagar Award, the Swiss National Science Foundation Fellowship Award, Julius Claus Foundation Award, Rama Langa Swami Fellowship Award, etc. He serves on the editorial board of PLOS One and PMC Genomics. His area of research is on integrated cancer genomics. With these words, let us welcome Dr. Amit Dutt from Actric Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. Right. So, can you hear me? We have Dr. Amit Dutt with us. Sir, uh, you can please share your screen and continue with your. So I'm sharing my screen. Is it open the share tray? That's the one. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Your slides are visible. Uh, you can make the slides in full mode and then. Can you see yeah. the slides in the full mode? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, so, uh, very good evening to everyone. Um, this is uh, uh, a, with a great heart, um, the sudden loss of uh, Professor Vinti Banerjee and to this whole community, a uh, uh, loss that perhaps cannot be kind of like any other. So, uh, in fond memory of her, um, I'm, I'm privileged to uh, dedicate this talk and present this presentation uh, about with regards to a project uh, that has um, a collaborative basis with IIT Bombay, uh, primarily with uh, Professor Amir Banerjee that I'm going to be talking about today. So my laboratory is based here at Actrack Tata Memorial Center um, in the outskirts of Mumbai. It's the Carter where we are kind of located. And my laboratory primarily focuses on uh, understanding the different genetic alterations that underlies different human cancers. 
And today I'm going to be talking and emphasizing primarily uh, with regards to uh, head and neck cancer. And to be more precise, I will be talking about uh, tongue cancer uh, uh, to be very precise. And in tongue cancer, I'm going to talk about two different aspects and overview of that that I will be presenting to you. Um, where we have been characterizing and trying to understand the genetic alterations and initiative uh, that is very much required to be taken from this part of the world, uh, given that the higher incidence that what we tend to get to see uh, in the Indian subcontinent and something which is not that common uh, in the Caucasian, among the Caucasian population. At the same time, I'm going to talk about some uh, very interesting lead from the laboratory in collaboration with Dr. Anirban Banerjee from IIT Bombay. Um, uh, some some uh, recent discoveries and how we are taking it further. So uh, before uh, I get started, here I start with a very brief introduction uh, to the head and neck cancer. You may be very well aware of that head and neck cancer. Um, uh, there, there are several subsites which are uh, involved in uh, which, which constitute it's a very heterogeneous disease which constitutes the head and neck cancer. These subsites are the buccal mucosa. Um, uh, or the tongue, uh, the gingiva, or the floor of the mouth. These are all different subsites. And in general, uh, my laboratory is primarily been focusing on the uh, the cancers of the oral cavity that can be called as uh, the oral cancer in particular. And if you would see as the distribution, you would see that majority of this incidence, uh, the bulk of it is contributed by uh, the Asian population, and uh, let's we'll speak about by the Indian subcontinent. Uh, among these uh, subsites, my laboratory has primarily been focusing on the tongue cancer. Uh, there have been other initiatives, other initiatives in India, which have been uh, working on um, and emphasizing on the other aspects of the subsites of the oral cavity, such as the buccal mucosa, and primarily the Department of from the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. However, my laboratory is primarily into the tongue cancer. So, uh, what question that what we are asking over here at ACTRAC, I'm going to introduce you through the slide is a clinical problem uh, and um, that forming at the basis of the biological hypothesis that we would want to generate to answer and address this clinical problem uh, that what we tend to get to see in the clinics, I would say, on a daily basis. So here what you see is that um, tongue cancer, if it is uh, detected early, um, uh, then the survival is much higher as I will show you in here, if it is detected at a later stage, uh, the therapeutic options that is available is just surgery or chemo radiation. I mean, most of the times at an advanced stage, surgery possibly could not be performed. It's finally the chemo radiation and, uh, uh, and the management of the disease. So if you would see uh, the number of people who have been dis uh, who have been diagnosed since they have been diagnosed, and if you would see the over a span period of five years, not more than 20% could actually survive. However, if it is detected early on, uh, survival is much more significantly different and it's much higher. Among the early stage, what happens in something which is very interesting is that there is a phenomenon called as metastasis. And this metastasis is something which is very typical to endemic cancer, to oral cancer, where metastasis, that is the spreading of the disease from its primary site to um, the other sides where uh, it happens in a way that it is, uh, it is called as an occult metastasis. And uh, I'll come into um, uh, specifics of this occult metastasis in a minute. Uh, if there is an occult metastasis, um, that is which, which accounts for about like 30% of them, uh, then the survival is significantly low. However, 70% of these patients uh, of the only cancer, tongue cancer patients who walks into the clinics at Tata Memorial and in general in Indian subcontinent, they do not have this underlying occult or cryptic or hidden metastasis. Uh, and these guys would survive much higher as what you would compare it from here. They have been detected early. There is no metastasis as well, and it is 80% of a survival. 80% of those guys will survive after five years. However, if there is a metastasis, that is a cryptic metastasis, uh, then the survival again is significantly low. So the question is that why not to um, just uh, identify these guys where there is um, uh, where there is a, a cryptic metastasis uh, in these folks and then treat them differently. But the problem is 
that all the clinical measures that what they currently kind of employ into the clinics, whether it is uh, CT scan, whether it is MRI or whether it is PET scan, they do not have the resolution to uh, detect the presence of these uh, cryptic, or that's what I meant by occult or hidden metastases, uh, which is not very easy. So the, the moment a surgery is surgery, a surgeon is cutting open uh, the and the tumor is being taken out at that point of time, a surgeon does not have an information whether there is a cryptic metastasis um, underlying or if there is no uh, metastasis. And and essentially, then what kind of like leads to? Uh, I will show you in the next slide that was a clinical trial that was performed at Tata Memorial Center. Every patient undergoes uh, um, that is called as um, a surgical uh, modality that is called as a neck dissection. What happens is where you remove the tumor and then in anticipation that the lymph nodes would also be uh, uh, be activated, be, be infected with these tumor cells, the lymph nodes uh, without having the information whether there is a metastasis or not, then lymph nodes uh, in a completely diagnostic way, the lymph nodes are also being removed. Now, what happens is that when you perform this gruesome, I would rather use the word, when you perform this neck dissection, that leads to huge morbidity. The patient is not able to speak properly. The patient is not able to eat properly. And there are other, you might have seen different kind of like a structural morbidity, which is associated with uh, when uh, these neck dissections are performed. But this neck dissection is the only way to protect uh, these guys who have the metastasis. These 70 percent of the folks who do not have the metastasis actually could be spared of the surgery if the surgeon at the time of performing the surgery could have the reliable information that these patients would not have an underlying metastasis and these patients would have the metastasis which is underlying. So uh, what is actually is required that would kind of like save these folks, the 70 percent, the bulk of them could be saved from their high cost of the surgery and at the same time the morbidity which is associated with it. But how do you do that? Uh, there is now, uh, now there comes the biology to it that using uh, uh, different approaches, if you're able to identify what, what would help stratify or identify these folks and would able to discern them from these people uh, where the surgery need to be performed. And as what I just said, there was a clinical trial that was, you can always argue that 70% out over there uh, do not have the lymph node metastasis. Why don't you just leave it on? But if you would do that, uh, that leads to a disastrous outcome. Uh, so uh, a, a clear phase three clinical trial, a very high profile clinical trial was performed by Dr. Anil G. Cruz, the former director of Tata Memorial Hospital. And they showed, it's called as the N0 study. And it showed that if you perform the surgery where you remove the uh, nodes irrespective of whether there is a metastasis or not uh, the overall outcome is better and that is being um, that is being followed across pan india and in other countries as well so uh, so that brings to the question if we are able to identify if we could find markers that can help um, stratify these and such as like prognostic markers so what we did in our laboratory is that we collaborated with these uh, clinicians at Data Memory Center. Primarily, our collaborator was Dr. Sudhir Nair, uh, who uh, is a head and a cancer surgeon at based at Actra. What we did is that we took a bunch of uh, tumors uh, and uh, which where we knew the outcome of. In fact, we also got the samples from these clinical trials that was that I just kind of like showed, and we knew that which of these tumors were nodal positive and which were more negative and we performed um, uh, we performed whole exome sequencing on those. So today I'm not going to take you into the details of that. This is just a heat map presentation, uh, one of the early studies done around from this part of the world, um, where uh, each of these columns you find over here are, um, are samples and each of these rows that what you find are the genes and um, the genes altered uh, in that sample, in that patient, uh, are shown by these solid blocks. And here is a copy number of alterations, that is the amplification and deletion across the whole uh, genome that is being sh uh, shown here. So uh, several of these uh, discoveries uh, that what we initiated initially in the laboratory has already been published. Uh, we found like such as notch one as a therapeutic target, but I'm not going to talk about that today. What I'm going to talk about is an overexpression of a matrix metalloprotease gene that is an MMP10 
uh, we found that MMP10 was very significantly amplified and overexpressed. Here is an IFC, and here is a real-time PCR validation of that as well. Um, we did it for a significant number, about like more than 50 samples, and in fact, we uh, sorry, it was more than 200 odd samples because we also got the sample from the clinical trial, the N0 clinical trial that I just kind of like showed a few slides back. And what we found was that 86% of these guys um, uh, who were node positive, that is who had the metastasis, had an overexpression of MMP10. Now that's a bingo. So you would be able to now uh, readily really, or even before the surgery, you do an IHC uh, in under the clinical settings with uh, uh, with MMP10 and uh, you would be able to discern. So, but then the laboratory uh, wants to understand the underlying biology as well. One of our uh, uh, graduate students in the laboratory, Bhaskar Tarawat, took this as a challenge. What he did is as follows. Uh, what he did is that he takes MMP10 as a gene, which has been found from the clinical study that it is overexposed in our genomic base. So what he does is that he takes the MMP10 as a single gene and then he takes a uh, tongue cancer cell line, and these tongue cancer cell lines, they do not metastasize, okay? So what it does is that he overexpresses MMP10, mimicking the case that what you get to see in the clinical settings as what is just shown over here. Then you overexpress MMP10, and what you found is that these cells where the MMP10 is overexpressed, they showed a higher migration ability. And not only that, there is a phenotype which is called as invasion which is very significantly associated with metastasis. And he found the cells, when they are overexpressed with this MMP10, they tend to also invade more. And uh, that is that these experiments showed that MMP10 is essential for these phenotypes that is, oh sorry, it is necessary for these phenotypes such as um, migration and invasion. And then he takes an, another bunch of cell lines these are different cell lines, again, tongue cancer cell lines, Cal27 and AW8507. And what he does in these cells, he knocks it down. He knocks down the same gene by SHRNA, that is uh, knocking down the MMP10. You would see the decreasing expression of MMP10 and what you tend to get to see. The phenotype migration decreases in both the cells and also the invasion decreases. So that means that MMP10 is not only sufficient or not only necessary, but it's also essential for the phenotype that is the migration and um, and invasion. Uh, then what Bhaskar does that along with the postdoctoral and the lab, that is Dr. Ashwin Butle, he goes into and now what we want to do is that we want to study it in the real settings and then we want to make an orthotopic mouse model. In that case, what we do is that we don't just put the tumor cells under the skin and make a skin xenograph, but let us do it directly onto the tongue because these are tongue cancers. And what you're, what you're seeing over here is a small snippet where uh, the, the, the mice is anesthetized. And what you're seeing is that what Dr. Ashwin Butler is doing is that he takes those cells where there is an MMP10. And in that cell, they also put a luciferase tag, okay, which would have the fluorescence and directly injected into the tongue of this. So do you see over here? And soon this, there would be diffusion, there would be uh, this, this bulb would be kind of like gone. And what you will tend to get to see is that within some time, you see that everything has regressed over here, the, uh, the, the liquid. And soon you would see that uh, what we tend to get to see in that 24 or 25 days, uh, these mouse, they develop the tongue tumor. And uh, here is the tongue tumor that what you kind of like get to see. Now, because these tongue tumors, uh, these cells that were injected, they also had the luciferase gene. Uh, we could now, we don't even have to kill the mice. In the live imaging could be performed at that memorial act track that of uh, what is being done at or what is actually being done in the patients. We also do it in the small image, animal imaging facility. And what is what you, what you tend to get to see now is that that you see that when the when the cells are injected, you see that it's not just the metastasis to the nodes, but also um, the metastasis could be seen at uh, different organs under the cell. And if you would knock it down, you would see that the metastasis was kind of like totally down, totally kind of like gone. So basically what we kind of like, and this is the same thing that what we showed with the overexpression and with the knockdown and across different cell lines, uh, is that um, that when the MMP10 is overexpressed, also the tumor formation was higher and the metastasis was higher. And then the MMP10 is knocked down, then the expression level is brought down. 
uh, the expression uh, of the, the, the metastasis was found to be like significantly low. So what does that kind of like establish to us? What that teaches us is that MMP10 is something which is important, essential, um, and also sufficient in driving the metastasis. But Bhaskar was interested to understand what mediates this. How does MMP10 lead to the metastasis and what regulates the MMP10? You remember that MMP10 was found to be overexpressed in our initial studies. So again, what Bhaskar does, again, a set of like um, uh, elegant biochemical and molecular based experiments. What it does is that uh, we again go back to the genomics. We What we do is that we take the, uh, as I've already said, that we had the cell lines where we overexpress MMP10. So what we take is now, we have the right reagents. We have cells where the MMP10 is overexpressed. We have the cells where MMP10 is, is downregulated. What we do is that we perform whole transcriptome sequencing on those and small RNA sequencing in the as well. Uh, what we find is that, um, that I'm um, cutting a long story short, what we find is that there was a discovery of a micro RNA that was mid 944 that was found to be also um, going along with the metastasis, the, 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 the tumors where uh, the patients which had the metastasis, they also, along with the MMP10, there was also, uh, there was an inverse anti-correlation, there was a, a decrease in the expression of the mid-944. Basker goes on to do a luciferase, that's a biochemical assay, an elegant assay, where it shows that MMP10 actually binds to the three prime UTR of, um, of the MMP10, and that's how it kind of like, so MMP, when the, when the MMP, uh, when the mid-944 goes up, the MMP comes down when the um, uh, MED944 goes down, the MMP comes down. That's, that's how it's kind of like regulated. And also the phenotype that what we kind of like found when uh, Basker performed the overexpression of, um, of uh, MED944 or down regulation, that is an anti correlation or down regulation of an MP10, they both had a, a similar kind of like phenotype. Uh, so that way, Basco kind of like knew that the mil, uh, the micro RNA mid 944 regulates the MMP10 band with the, with the downstream analysis again using the genomics. That in a long story short, he looked for those genes that when MMP10 goes up, what 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 pathway uh, comes downstream to the MMP10. Cutting a long story short, he found some very intriguing and a very interesting finding that he finds that there is a gene called as an axle, which is a tyrosine kinase. And we know that tyrosine kinase inhibitors against even the axle is approved in clinics and in other different cancers. And what Pascal shows that axle gets overexpressed, that leads to uh, mesenchymal epithelial mesenchymal transition. I'm not taking you into that. What I'm trying to tell you is that um, from the from the clinics, we we observe a clinical question that there is a problem, there is an unmet need to identify marker. We take those primary tumors, we perform genomics onto it in a completely unbiased manner without any hypothesis to begin with. Then we come to a lead of a micro of a MMP10 to be found to be overexpressed. Then we find micro RNA that is down uh, when MMP10 goes up and then we find that the effect of the MMP10 is actually mediated by Axel, that is a tyrosine kinase. And uh, uh, we, we, we show that by doing knockdowns and everything, that there is a complete whole axis which is involved in. Um, so the complete whole pathway is something that what we dissect um, that leads to the metastasis uh, in, um, uh, in, in early cancer. Uh, what I want to talk about in the, um, in the, in the remaining time is a second aspect to the same study and the leads uh, with regards to uh, that what we are performing with Dr. Anirban Banerjee at IIT Bombay. So uh, uh, my laboratory is primarily a genomics laboratory. You might have kind of like uh, realized by now and we do all of like competition analysis, but at the same time, my laboratory has a very strong uh, functional part of it of, of doing the biochemical and the molecular uh, analysis using cell-based and the molecular biology approaches. Uh, uh, using um, uh, using computational approaches, my laboratory has a long-term interest in also understanding if there is a pathogen which is associated with uh, cancer. What we know from literature is that 18% or even 20% of human cancer is actually associated with infection. You know about the HPV in cervical cancer, so we went out and tried to ask that if we can find something uh, uh, something which is associated with the oral cancer, and uh, that's what we and and it is now getting like more and more, uh, more and more significant, and more and more discoveries are being done in this field. So you would see that these pathogens, when they are associated with these phenot uh, with phenotypes, you would find that uh, here what is being shown is the hallmark of uh, uh, cancer by 
um, by Hanan, um, uh, by Weinberg and Hanahan, um, uh, Hanahan and Weinberg, and what you would see is that all of these um, phenotypes are actually in one way or other way affected also by the pathogen, by the microbial guy, actually, microbes. Um, and uh, and more recently now that you are, you may be aware of that very recently in 2022, this uh, hallmarks of human cancer has just been updated by Hanahan. And where they, what have they added more? They, what they have added more is the infection that the pathogens, which is a source now, it becomes a hallmark, such as the significant association of the pathogen with the human cancer that is so well established. And I said earlier that 20% of human cancer is actually associated with human cancer. So what we did is another graduate student, a competition student in the laboratory, um, uh, Sanket Desai. What Sanket Desai does is that uh, he does a computation subtraction. Now that's a very um, that's a very conceptually very uh, easy to think about to, to explain is that you perform a human genome sequencing and then uh, given that thanks to the uh, human genome project that was completed around in 2002, 2004, um, that now we have the baseline reference human genome. So what you do is like you take a tumor sample, you do the sequencing and then you align to the reference human sequence. So you know that human genome is here and your uh, sequence from the tumor is here, you align them, and whatever matches with them, just throw it out of the window. So you will find reads that do not match to the human reference. Now, those reads that do not match to the human reference, what Sankate does, that he has developed these algorithms. This is a very uh, sophisticated and a very, and, and it's an open source, you can download from my laboratory. And uh, he goes ahead and, and he aligns them, he made a complete database of pathogens, uh, and he aligns them to the pathogen and he identifies if there is uh, some pathogen that would be associated with that. In the times of COVID, we, we, we developed, we, we, we had developed it for pathogen analysis, but at the time of COVID, we added a COVID module to it that if we can discover and if we can also classify those COVID, um, uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes, and we were very successful in doing that, and that was kind of like already published. but. But my laboratory was primarily interested in understanding the pathogens uh, with uh, associated with the human cancer. So what Sanket did is like all the exome and sequencing that was done in the lab, it took up across all the different tumor. This is one of the first study uh, from an individual laboratory here in India, um, uh, where the colorectal was in collaboration with Dr. Muli Basham, um, where uh, where pathogen analysis was done pan across all the tumors from Indian patients. So you can see these are the different tumor types that were taken and um, along with the TCG samples in total, we had like 1500 samples run through these tools. And then because we are doing it for the first time for the Indian samples, you would want to know that there are a lot of like QCs and uh, checks and balances in place. Um, what what what, what Sanket shows is that if you would look at the tumor, there is a, there is a uh, uh, there is something called as a tumor mutation burden. So every tumor has a signature number of mutations. Uh, lung cancer would have higher because it has a direct exposure to the uh, to the carcinogen. Uh, skin cancer would have a very high uh, um, a tumor mutation burden. However, the cancers which are not directly exposed to the tumor mut mutagen, such as breast cancer and also the leukemia and all, they have a much low uh, tumor mutation burden. So when we looked, uh, when 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 we uh, use these tools and then we found that uh, they, they do align in the way that you would expect them to be. So we were, we were definitely on to the right track. So here is the first representation to you about the landscape of, our, of the pathogens which are associated with the human cancer. Um, this is uh, and primarily uh, in general human cancers. And here you are seeing 1500 samples, which is each one of them there in the column. And here are the pathogens uh, at the level of uh, genus. That is what is shown over here. Now, there are certain um, pathogens that you would expect to find, such as HPV, which is known to be present in cervical cancer. We all know about that. So did we find it? Let's see. So here is an HPV, and what you're finding over here is that HPV is primarily present in the cervical cancer. Yes, we did find HPV. What we also found that HPV was present in oral cancer. Now, that is something that is hedonic cancer, which is something also known in the literature. So that's fine. That's great. Uh, at the same time, when we look into colorectal cancer, we know that there is a good incidence of fusobacterium, there is bacteroids, and that is Escherichia coli. That is known in the literature. These are kind of like positive control. Did we pick up in our studies? Indeed, we did. We found that these were kind of like upregulated and they were kind of like present in these tumor types specifically. So 
is there any anything interesting in you? Anything, any surprises? Yes, what we found is a big surprise is that in the head and neck cancer, fusobacterium, which was known to be earlier present in, 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 in colorectal cancer, it has also been reported to be present in cervical cancer, but, but it has been shown to be driving colorectal cancer and also associated with different phenotypes in colon, in colon cancer. We found that the fusobacterium which is again, I mean, it could be a common cell bacteria, but then it was found to be in a significantly, uh, there, were, uh, there, there were a lot of statistics put into it and, um, and with all the stringent filters, which I'm not talking about and discussing today, uh, due to the privilege of time, uh, what we found is that, um, uh, that the fusobacterium was significantly present. That was a discovery in the oral cancer. And in fact, the fusobacterium in head and neck cancer was something uh, uh, which was uh, comparable to what is known in the colorectal cancer. And, and the most interesting thing uh, was, um, the most interesting thing that what we found is that in head and neck cancer, the samples which were harboring or which were infected by HPV, they did not have fusobacterium. And the samples which were infected by fusobacterium did not have HPV. They were mutually exclusive. So have we really identified a, a novel subclass of fusobacterium? That's what it looked like. And But what does it really mean? What does it really do? So what Sanket does is that he does like all those genomic analysis, the transcriptome analysis, and tries and look for the downstream genes when the fusobacterium, when the cells, uh, are, when, when the patients are infected by fusobacterium, fusobacterium, or when the, cell, uh, the patients are not. Uh, so first he does is that he compares with the HPV infected patients and um, Fusobacterium uh, patient effectively find that there was no overlap in genes that were upregulated, but there was a significant overlap in genes that were downregulated, suggesting that there was some kind of like a uh, tra post transcriptional role, possibly, or an epigenetic role that were kind of like associated with these infections. Uh, what what Sanket finds is something very interesting, but not very surprising, is that uh, the genes that were involved. Um, and the interview genes and all, which are involved in inflammation. Whenever there is an infection with a bacteria, there will be an inflammation. We all know that, and that's the the molecular evidence that uh, the genes, which are cytokines, which are involved in inflammation, they were found to be higher uh, expressed in those samples where there were uh, HPV infection, and that's a kind of like an internal QC, an internal positive control. But by taking these things into more into the details, Sanket systematically analyzed and he found again some microRNAs. Uh, which were uh, significantly associated with the infection of um, uh, associated with the infection of the bacterium. And when he analyzed to the candidates or the uh, likely candidates of these microRNAs, uh, he found that those were candidates were those which were involved uh, in pro-tumorogenic microenvironment. What it means is that the patients who were uh, infected with the uh, with, with, with the fusobacterium, they tend to have uh, a pro that is uh, that is in favor of tumorogenesis, there are the, the, the immune response is kind of like suppressed as what is kind of like seen over here. The, the regulatory T cells was down to be kind of like in a completely different direction. Not only that, we found that the patients where the fusobacterium infection was high, they survived less as what is kind of like seen over here. Um, uh, as what is seen in the TCGA, that is in the Caucasian population, they survive much shorter as compared to the patients where there is a low fusobacterium. So definitely we, what we have identified uh, these genomic analysis is that that has allowed us to identify a subtype of uh, of uh, oral cancer where there is a fusobacterium infection. And what is the relevance of it? If you're thinking and if you're, if, 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 you're, uh, if you're imagining that, are you going to treat oral cancer or tongue cancer with an antibiotic? Why not? Uh, metronidazole, which is specific to uh, fusobacterium, uh, is being given, uh, it's FDA approved and given in different uh, managing diarrhea and other different kind of, because this uh, fusobacterium kind of like associated with those. Um, so that could be given to these patients, uh, oral cancer patients, where there is a, uh, because we also found that those where, uh, where there is more of an extra capsular spread, that there is more of metastasis, fusobacterium was found to be like higher. So, our, uh, so, so that opens the treatment measures where uh, uh, they can be offered these kind of, and screening can be performed uh, and uh, with, with these antibiotics, which is well tolerated. So that's that's kind of like a significant step in the managing of this oral cancer. Uh, recently got like published as well in NAR cancer, there was a big news about it as well. So, and along with Dr. Anil Banerjee at um, IIT Bombay, what we are performing is that we are co-culturing. Um, what, what we are doing is that here is the human tumor cells, 
uh, from the from the oral cancer. And here is the fusobacterium, what amid one does. And uh, the students from his laboratory, they co-cultured them together and see that what really the microRNAs, um, are they really able to mimic the uh, fusobacterium infection or not? And the other phenotypes that are being associated with it, that is currently underway that I kind of like talked about just now. So uh, the laboratory is a big group, and the primarily the work that I've talked about today is um, of the work of Sanket Desai, a PhD student uh, okay, who talked about with regard to the discovery of fusobacterium, and Bhaskar Tarawat, another graduate student who found the MNP10 uh, that was initially found by a uh, former student, uh, Pavel Upadhyay. Uh, we work uh, in closely with several different kinds of like tumor dyes with different clinicians of Dr. Memorial. Today I've talked about only head and neck cancer and the collaborative work with Dr. Sudeep Nair. Uh, we are very generously funded by Tata Memorial Center by the Department of Biotechnology. We are formally uh, funded by the Welcome Trust TV Data Alliance, TV Virtual. We are one of the Mobile Virtual National Cancer Institute um, uh, Center, uh, and by the uh, CERB uh, DST and the Terry Fox Foundation. So, uh, with that, I bring an end. Uh, I believe I have a summary slide. Oh. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. So, what we talked about today is that we talked about that. Um, all uh, the um, uh, 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 the, uh, we, we defined a clinical problem. We and then we went ahead and did genomics with that, and we identified that MMP10 could be a candidate to answer that clinical problem to stratify whom to be given a therapy that is a surgery and whom not to be given. And then we went ahead and we identified that those where there is uh, more of like metastasis. Um, um, uh, uh, there is an infection, there's a subclass of head and neck cancer where there is more of an infection with fusobacterium and uh, that opens the door or an opportunity to treat them with an antibiotic. So with that, I will bring an end to my uh, talk and um, uh, should there be some questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, sure. Now I would... Um, like if audience have any question, they can ask. Please raise your hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Please ask your question. Yeah, so thank you, sir, for such a wonderful uh, talk and such a great information. So sure. I was just wondering, sir, that if the genomic changes in the fusobacterium, as you said, that it is associated with the, the, the micro microbes that are associated with cancer, the changing genomes or the genomic level changes in those microorganisms, how much we should focus on their genomic level changes also in association with different cancers? So. Um... Uh, that's a that, that's a great question actually, and that's a pretty insightful question. We really do not know the complete real answer to it. We are just kind of like digging onto the surface of it. Um, uh, with regards to the oral cancer, I could possibly kind of like tell you uh, that um, I, mean, I mean, I mean, there is a very thin line difference where where there is a common cell nature of a bacteria, whether it is really present out over there and it is associated with the disease or not. Uh, that we were able to show in this specific studies and along with Dr. Anand Banerjee, we are going to establish by functional studies as well, uh, if it is so, similar to something that what uh, people have shown in the colorectal cancer. However, coming on to the other different kind of like cancer, for what we know is that in colorectal cancer, in colon cancer, the fusobacterium um, plays a significant role in the carcinogenesis. But then there are like other different studies which kind of like really suggest that those patients who have more of this bacterium in their oral cavity, they tend to get like more colon cancer as well. I mean, maybe this bacteria enters into the blood and in a systemic manner and kind of like goes and, ha and houses in and homes in the colon. And that's what kind of like leads to a completely different cancer. Whether this happens to all the other different kind of like tumors as well, we really do not know. There were some very elegant experiments where it was done where the fusobacterium was directly given into the bloodstream of, of mice and people thought that, okay, if colon is the home to colon or, or colon, if colon is the home to fusobacterium, it would go over there, it would colonize and it will form tumors, but it did not. It, it went to other different regions as well. So, so the question is very much open that uh, with regards to the fusobacterium or with regards to the other different kind of like bacteria, whether other tumor types are also driven by 
homing of these um, uh, of, of these microbes in those. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very open question. We really do not know so much about it. We are going step by step and learning about it. We know more about it. We know about in gastric cancer, um, helicobacteria pylori. We know about uh, cervical cancer. Now we know about head and neck cancer. Uh, we know about colorectal cancer, but we do not know uh, in majority of the other different kinds. For example, in lung cancer, there have been some scan reports which are talking about microbes to be associated and also in the breast cancer, uh, even though they are sterile organs. But uh, people have talked about it and what that requires more systematic and efforts to be characterized and to be performed. So as of now, the question is very open. I do not have a very direct, straightforward answer to your question that yes, these are the set of tumors that are exclusively driven by two by microbes and here are more so uh, that here are the set of tumors which have nothing to do with infection. We really do not know unless really, I mean, we have a more and more learning uh, with, with, with more evidence that is getting. But so that's why I totally endorse that the recent 2022 hallmarks of cancer that has recently been introduced where microbes have been incorporated onto it. I do completely believe that microbe is an hallmark of human cancer and perhaps I will leave it up there and um, uh, as a long answer to your short question. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So I understood that uh, still much more research is needed. So just another question or uh, just uh, it's just a curiosity to based on your study till now what has been done. Can we build up a colometric, uh, colometric assay or any kind of assay to detect uh, the stages of this cancer or to detect uh, or pre-detect the cancer or any kind of this assay based on the studies done till now? Um, there are um, enzymatic based assays, um, but but those assays are not that specific. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, there. I mean, these are cancers in general. We know that um, uh, certain uh, enzymatic biochemical assays are being performed, but uh, the outcome of that would actually imply that there is a kind of a any kind of like a cancer which is. Um, uh, uh, which, um, so there are much better off tests with higher sensitivity and higher resolution that you would want to rather perform than perform these enzyme based assays. I mean, nowadays there is more and more shift towards circulating tumor cells or more towards the CT DNA circulating. That's what is called as a liquid biopsy, circulating DNA, circulating RNA and those which is there in the blood that may be kind of like, but that's very much at its fermentation. I mean, it is still need to be kind of like developed. Uh, uh, enzymatic assays uh, telling you whether there is an underlying disease or not uh, is not something uh, that is kind of like that. But, but for specific tumor types and for a specific uh, um, uh, that is definitely uh, something that is still being followed, but not in generic or pan across all the uh, uh, it, it, it does not allow you to say whether the disease is kind of like present in a, in a patient or not. Uh, okay, sir. I guess, uh, sorry, sir. Actually, I'm taking long. Another question, just uh, for uh, but uh, just it's becoming curious a little bit. Uh, so, sir, this uh, what we know in that some uh, cancer cells which are derived due to molecular pathological changes, they, they create some changes that overcome our uh, immune system. That the immune system doesn't recognize the cancer cells. But these bacterial associated or microorganism associated cancer cells, why our immune system failed to respond to those foreign organisms and doesn't react? Means, uh, that was I just become curious. Means. I mean, um, so um, uh, the person who would be the most uh, suited to ask would be Professor Rahul Purwar uh, from IIT Bombay to address this question. But I'll try to kind of like. Uh, uh, in a very naive manner, try to address this. What essentially happens is that the tumor cells are smart. They tend to down, uh, downplay the immune actions or the immune response uh, to some gatekeeper uh, genes, such as the PDL1. Or, and what it does is that when it kind of like expresses the tumor cells, uh, the immune response uh, starts to identify them as their own, and there is uh, and, and and the tumor response is kind of like subdued. Uh, these are kind of like systemic responses and and as what I showed um, with regards to the fusobacterium as well, uh, you saw that the regulated tumor cells were kind of like higher. Uh, so uh, which, which kind of like suggests that there is a suppression of the immune response even associated when there is a uh, when there is an infection similar 
to uh, or, or so these fusions, uh, these these microbes tend to do similar to what the tumor cells. I mean, they are kind of like creating a pro-tumorigenic kind of like an ambient or an environment around that allows the cells to kind of like proliferate more and evade the immune response. So yeah, but but I still kind of like say the best person to ask uh, answer the details would be um, so I hope for that. Okay, thank you, sir, for answering sure. this question. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sure. Uh, now we we'll move on to our next speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Graham Ball. Professor Graham Ball joins us from Nottingham Trent University, UK. Professor Ball supervises the bioinformatics team at NTU and guides undergraduate and postgraduate research projects. He obtained his PhD in July 1996 after studying at the Trent Polytechnic. Now, the Nottingham Trent University. He has worked as a professor of bioinformatics at Nottingham Trent University since 2010. He has 25 years of experience in the development and application of bioinformatics algorithms using artificial neural networks and other machine learning techniques. Areas of interest include machine learning, precision medicine, deep learning, bioinformatics, systems biology, molecular driver identification, drug target identification, understanding molecular processes in drug repurposing, in silico prototyping of diagnostic data mining of complex data sets. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Graham Ball.
Hi, Professor Graham. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening, Sanjeeva. Yeah. How Looks are you? Like some audio issues. Yes, can you hear there. me okay? I can hear you well, yes. Can you? Yes, good. Yes. Yeah, great. All right. So there are some audio issue coming. I think team is fixing that. After that, we can have just, you know, your discussion on some points. OK. Is, I, I'm present now for the, the whole evening, so. So I see you have to unmute yourself and only the voice will come. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. OK. While playing the video, your audio should be on. Right. Uh, it's not audible, Aishi. So what we can do, we can just request Professor Graham to, you know, you can just show the slides. He can just quickly, you know, give some uh, comments on those slides. Okay, sir. Okay. Well, I can, I can share my screen and give the presentation directly if, if that's. That yeah. will be actually wonderful. So from the network part, I think, you know, if you could just walk us through it till then. Yes, yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Bear with me a second, please. OK, so um, I'll talk from this bit, if that's OK. OK, Great. so um, th this this part of the presentation is about um, how we move from effectively a list of genes to studying how features interact uh, with one another and in the context of a particular disease. And from that, identify potential drivers of disease state. So this is really trying to identify molecular causality of um, a given system, um, of a given set of features excuse me, in the system. So what we're using this same neural network engine, which has been defined before. So this is an artificial neural network. Uh, but instead of using the neural network to predict a given class, say disease or non-disease, we're using it to identify a gene. So we're using genes to predict a gene or genes. Um, and effectively, we're in this state, we're looking at multiple markers predicting one. And this tells us how things may interact with one another and how they may regulate one another. So in this system, we're looking at breast cancer, particularly proliferation. And the goal was to identify the drivers of that uh, proliferation system. So the way we do this is we, we build a, a neural network model. The light blue dots here are representing the input. The red dot is the output or the target. We build that model. We parameterize it. And here, the thickness of the lines represents the, the strength of interaction between the source, the blue dot, and the target, the yellow dot. And we then dial the dial round one, and the next gene in the list becomes a target. We keep going round until effectively every gene has been used to predict every other gene in our enriched list. So in our list of features of interest. Now we can add on to that. We can 
whether it's the connection is stimulatory or, inhib or inhibitory. So um, that will tell us very quickly whether a gene is upregulated by another gene or downregulated. And we can also then use cytoscape to, to change the layout of that. And we can put directionality onto that network. So for example, this gene has a strong negative regulatory effect on this gene. Here, the genes are represented by the yellow dots. This one has a strong positive interaction. And yeah, we can see feedback mechanisms in this network as well. So this is what those sort of networks look like in a real uh, model. This is 100 interactions. Excuse me. 100 factors across 100, uh, uh, which have 9,900 interactions, and that's unfiltered. And then by putting in various filters, eliminating weaker links, we can identify um, features which are strongly regulated or regulating. And you can see here, this is the, the map which was arising for the proliferation study. And you can see here SPAG5, which is one of the genes of, of interest, highly being highly influenced, and KIFC1, another one that's highly influenced. So these are hubs in our network. They're very important, and, they're, and they play a strong regulating role in the system. So as a result of this, we published uh, a paper in Lancet Oncology, and SPAG5 now as a marker of proliferation has been validated in over 15,000 cases. Um, it also, if we knock out SPAG5, we can identify um, processes that it's regulating as well. So um, in this study, the, um, the, the main work was conducted by Dr. Davika Agval, who is now in the University of Oxford. She did this as part of her PhD. And the work was also, con uh, um, well, I should acknowledge the head of the center at that point, who was Professor Bob Rees, who's now retired. We have a number of other people who are working in the Van Geest Cancer Research Center. This work was also conducted in conjunction with Professor Steve Chan and Ian Ellis and Dr. Tarek Abdul Fattah from Nottingham University's hospitals, and additional support was given by Paul Mosley. And lastly, we had funding from the Vice Chancellor's Bursary at Nottingham Trent, and we also had funding for the Centre from the John and Lucille Van East Foundation. So uh, that, that highlights the um, the, the second half of that, I'd be happy to take any questions and apologies if there's been an, an issue with the sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Professor Graham. It was, I think, wonderful to have you live and listen to that part of the presentation. Aisha, you can take over now for the Q&A. Yes, thank you, Professor Graham. Uh, I now request audience to, uh, like, if they have any question, they can ask. Please raise your hand and uh, then you can ask your questions. Yes, Ankit, yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for such a informative talk, sir. One question I had is the biomarkers that we uh, get after this uh, predicting uh, on the basis of the models. So how can we determine that this uh, marker is relevant for that particular pathway or what we are, what we are uh, that uh, that helps in the driving of that particular disease? Yeah, so so we can find out how much influence a, a, a molecule has on the system by taking the sum of the values leading from it using a process called graph theory. Um, in terms of relevance, then. You know, we, our view is very much that the pathways are a somewhat artificial construct and they're not complete. They're by no means complete. So what we often find is when we look at the, the genes driving the system, we see some things in, in the network that are well known. And usually it's around about 60% of the things that are well known. And then we find a 40% of new things that haven't previously been discovered playing a strong role in the network. So in, sen in one sense, the presence of the things that are well known and well published validates the, the, the new things that are discovered because they've been discovered with the same process. 
uh, also sir this uh, are these networks these networks are directional or uh, these are not direct 